been trying to get the, the owner of the tree to reduce them on, on a number of occasions. Uh, the trees cause damage um, by uh, blocking the gutters and the downpipes, which have to be cleaned and, and cleared regularly. They also affect the conservatory, which requires cleaning and maintenance, along with uh, cars on the driveway. Uh, the leaves and blossom blow onto the road and the drain and block the drains and the culverts. Uh, Seven Trent and Nottinghamshire County Council need to be called out regularly, and that the road is flooded to the the, the, the camber at the, at the centre of the road. Um, there's a covenant relating to the old vicarage where the trees are located that states um, that the boundary features should be repaired in good order, um, maintained in good order and repair. Previous owners used to have the trees trimmed to help um, prevent damage to the wall. Um, there's also concerns about leaves and blossom falling onto the, the alleyway at the side of the house and onto the pavement, causing it to become slippy. And a large branch from, fell from a tree on uh, uh, the old vicarage and it, it landed on the pavement and could have hurt someone. Um, the the objector has also suggested that they've got free bins, which are just enough to, to cope with their own leaves, but they can't cope with the, the, the leaves that come from the, the neighbour's trees. Um, I think what's really important in this, um, this, this situation is we, we establish what's a uh, nuisance under common law and what's a mere inconvenience. Common law has established that once a tree overhangs a property, it's a, a legal nuisance and the neighbour has the right to cut back the overhanging branches. Um, however, leaves, blossom, um, they're a natural event. They're something to be expected and it's a, it's a natural occurrence. They're a mere e inconvenience. They're not a legal nuisance. Uh, I think, unfortunately, maintaining windows, gutters, cars, you know, surfacing, it's, it's an inconvenience and it can be an expensive maintenance task, but it, it's part, part and parcel of owning a property. Um, and I don't think it would be a reason to, to prevent the TPO being um, confirmed. Uh, I also felt that the, uh, the work to the trees was inappropriate. Um, beets are quite a heavy uh, canopy. And if you reduce them too quickly or too heavily, it can cause uh, scorch to the to the limbs and the bark, and the lime would be um, would respond to a heavy reduction with a proliferation of new growth. Um, the, the concerns about flooding that really needs to be addressed by the county council. They're the lead local flood authority, and they also maintain the roads and the road gullies, so they would be best placed to to deal with that. And if we confirm the TPO, any damage to the wall. Or, or the gullies or the, the drainage network could be considered by an application to prune or, or, or fell the trees. Um, it's not clear if the branch that fell from the tree was one of the two we protected, but um, there is an exemption that allows dead branches to be removed without a TPO application. So, uh, you know, the, the, the tree preservation order wouldn't place an undue um, onus on, on, the, on, the, on the owner of the trees. Um, and as, uh, in terms of the sort of the leaves falling off and the impact in terms of you know the green bins and the, the maintenance aspect, we do charge a fee for for our green bins, but there are other ways to to manage leaves such as compost bins, um, which are you know low cost and and benefit you know your garden by producing compost. So it, it is recommended that the Granby Number One Tree Preservation Order be confirmed without modification. Okay, thank you very much. Now we we do have a guest speaker. Oh, we don't. Have, oh, yeah. oh we, uh, is, here? is Dr. Lo is Dr. Lawrence uh, Dr. Wilson here? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. So so uh, well, I was just going to just going to say yes. We we have got a uh, a guest speaker for this item. So uh, Dr. Wilson. So if you'd like to come and sit at that chair, and I'm so, sorry we didn't know you were if you you were here. <laughs> So, no, absolutely, uh, whatever you're comfortable with, and and uh, uh, as you probably be, as you probably know, you've got up to five minutes to address the committee. Um, as soon as you're ready to start, press the right hand button. The red light will come on, and if you're still talking at four and a half minutes, we'll let you know you've got thirty seconds left. <laughs> no, okay, then. So, as soon as you're ready, it's over to you. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, big, the biggest problem is that they should be regularly maintained, but it has been suggested about one and a half to two years, but they've done nothing. So they've just got bigger and bigger and bigger, 
And so they're producing more and more blossom in the spring and more and more leaves in the autumn. And it's blocking the drains even more. So the, dra the drains are getting filled with blossom or leaves, but raw sewage as well. The drain can't cope. It's flowing back up the drain, through the, up through the grating, into the gutter, where the flooding climbs up the camber of the road. It's about 50 mil from the crown of the road. Once it gets there, that's it. It will cascade over. Granby is on a hill where our side is higher than the other side. So it will flow down and flood all those bungalows and houses. That's with raw sewage. It's no good saying that the seven trend or whatever come out because they don't. You can't ring them up and say, "I'm going to flood tomorrow. Can you come out and see to it?" You've got, you do it after it's flooded when the damage has occurred. That's the big main problem. Thank you. Okay, right. Do I switch it off. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's fine. Yes, so, so no, press it again. On. It will go off. Oh. It's not. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so it's Dr. Wilson uh, 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 speaking to us. There is the uh, and you live next door, don't you? You're the, the neighbour to the yeah. So um, well, we've heard what Dr. Wilson uh, said. Uh, his his main concern is the uh, falling leaves and blocking of drains. And uh, I was a little bit surprised to hear about sewage coming out of drains. But obviously, we're here to talk about the tree and the uh, and the uh, the leaves and uh, uh, and also he thinks the trees should be maintained. Is there anything you, you can help us with there, uh, Mr. Petty? And especially the the comment that was made about uh, request the tree is maintained or looked after. Is there any sort of thing we can say about that? Yes, I, I forgot to mention earlier that we, um, Dr. Wilson, did notify us about wanting to prune back the overhanging branches of this tree, uh, and we did grant permission for that. And I think uh, the second photo. Uh, shows that that was the the tree following the work. As you can see, it's it's opened up the canopy a little bit, but it still maintained the the appearance and the character of the trees. So we we do understand your concerns, and we have allowed some work to take place to these trees to try and minimise the impact on you. We just felt that a reduction by fifty percent would be harmful to the trees and their appearance, and by in turn harmful to the character of the conservation area. So, you know, we we have tried to allow work, but we feel there's a balance to be struck and this is a step too far. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pettit. So um, there's no, we, we, no, no other speakers on this from uh, our visitors. So who would like to? Uh, Councillor Bailey. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Is there any way that we can encourage I think enforcement is perhaps a, a bad way of describing it, but encourage the um, owners of the tree within their garden to actually look after and maintain these two trees. Thank you. Um, that, that's a good point. It, it's, a, it's a balance that needs to be struck. Um, our role is, is to primarily protect trees in this situation and we want to make sure that when trees are pruned they, they continue to enhance the public realm. That's what we're primarily trying to do with the, with the tree preservation order. Dr Wilson does have the right to remove any overhanging branches. He will need to notify us when he wants to do that work. But um, given that it's a, a legal nuisance and we have allowed the branches to be reduced in the past, we, we, we would probably allow that again. I just felt the reduction wasn't, wasn't appropriate. My, my concern, um, Chairman, is that Dr. Wilson is inconvenienced by the trees within, is it the Grange it's called? Uh, the Old Vicarage. The Old Vicarage. Um, can the owners of the Old Vicarage not be um, strongly encouraged to actually um, maintain and prune their tree on a regular basis? Because this is only going to get worse, you know, as a tree matures. But obviously it's a really important tree within the public realm. So I would hate to see it um, go, but is, can we do something to request that it's by the owners in, in the old vicarage to actually look after the, their, their trees? There isn't legislation that states how a deciduous tree should be maintained. There's legislation that covers uh, loss of light from evergreen high hedges, 
when it comes to deciduous trees, it, it's up to the owner to decide how they want to maintain it. In this situation, we've stepped in to say the work was, was inappropriate. It may be the case that the two neighbours could come to a, a mutual agreement about some, some a, a slightly less reduction, and you know we would be open to to considering that. Um, but really, I think it is for the owner to decide how he wants to maintain his trees. It, it is, but it cuts both ways, and we we felt that the work was was was, was too much. If we get to a, oh sorry, did you, did, uh, Councillor Healy, are you wanting to? Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just looking at the photograph, I mean, the the, the road is tree lined literally all the way down. Does this same problem exist as you go further in? Because I'm not aware, and I'm sure we're not aware, that other people have complained about the problem that uh, Dr. Wilson is is making. Um, and of course, the other point is that you know, if 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 trees are overhanging, my neighbour's trees are overhanging my garden. I think I'm right in saying, and I think you you confirmed it, that I'm perfectly entitled to trim those back. That, that's correct. I mean, Dr. Wilson, because he's in a conservation area, needs to notify us if he wants to prune back the overhanging branches. But like I say, we, we have allowed that. Um, I don't know if the rest of the road suffers from flooding. But I think trees lining roads is a common occurrence, and it would be more than reasonable to expect the county council to maintain their gullies um, in the autumn because of falling leaves. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Councillor Mason. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I look at this and really I consider that it's part, part and parcel, as has been said, of owning a prop, any property that um, you should keep things pruned um, and also well uh, looked after. Um, and I feel that if damage has been caused, and it says it in, so in the report to the wall and that the wall is damaged, then evidence is needed and, um, and perhaps some other way of looking at it. But as far as I can see at the moment, um, I don't see that that is uh, happening. And as regards the um, the owner, it do, he does have a general duty of care. Um, some dead branches have been removed and that has been successful. Um, and also with the county council. Um, now, as regards the county council, can the neighbour contact the county council, or is it only the owner that can contact the county council to ask that the drains be uh, maintained? I have a similar situation with my house um, <clears throat> in that there are trees and neighbours, leaves, petals, everything goes into the drains. And they've cleared the drains recently. Well, they've built new ones. But um, can a neighbour um, do that? Could the neighbour do that and ask for them to come and clear the drain? I, th I think anybody could approach the county yeah. council. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I'm going to make a very same point. Anybody can, can go along to the county council uh, uh, to say, there's a blocked drain here. Can you come and sort it out? So yeah. it doesn't have to be the neighbour. It could be anybody. It could be yeah. someone just happening to be driving along and notices it so. and perhaps that's part um of the answer um to the situation that we find ourselves in because i feel as a councillor i have a duty of care as well and that's to the tree not just um the people and i feel that we should make sure that the tree is looked after and i would hate to think that anything we had done had um or said had caused damage to the tree so um I would like to recommend that uh, we accept the tree preservation order and that it's been confirmed without modification. That doesn't mean to say I don't feel sorry for neighbours, but we have to look after our countryside and our trees, which are very um, precious to us. Um, so thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Mason. Um, right, well, I, 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 do, do, I didn't see any other hands going up to speak. Do you have a seconder for that uh, proposal? Uh, Councillor Phillips, do you, do you want to add anything to that or are you happy just to? No, I just think it's important that the, uh, the TPO is um, uh, granted and then we can look after the tree and make sure it gets the right sort of maintenance that it requires as opposed to not having a TPO. OK, thank you very much. Right. Well, we the, the tree, trees are always going to be emotive, aren't they? We, we, we all like them, but also we have to accept the fact that there can be downsides as well. And it's like so many things. It's a, it's a balancing act, isn't it? But I, th I think we've we've covered all the, uh, uh, the, the points on this one. So uh, uh, we've had the recommendation, as in the report, moved and seconded. I think we better make a decision on this. Can I have a show of hands for those in favour of the recommendation, please? So I think that's uh, and for unanimous, but for the record, no one against and no abstentions. So uh, the recommendation is carried per the report, but uh, uh, we, we do. Uh, uh, I hope that you realise that there are there are some protections for yourself still, and and if there are ongoing issues with drains, etc., there will be ways to deal with those. But thank thank you for uh, getting your points across to us. So uh, we'll move on to our next application now which is another uh, tree uh, or uh, preservation order. And this time, this is uh, number four farm, close to, four, four farm Close, East Bridgeford. So uh, Mr. Pettit again, please. We've protected um, a white bean in the, the open front garden of Four Farm Close. It's a um, property within a small estate of 23 houses constructed in the 1980s in East Bridgeford. Um, uh, the 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 tree is um it's the one to the left of the the black car you can see in that photo and this is the approach into the estate and as you can see um i think it was designed so the front garden would give a nice pleasant open uh, aspect to the the approach into the the road um this is a view from the other direction looking back out uh, again the trees just to the right of that black car but you can see there's there's quite a number of other trees in this estate giving it a nice sort of leafy characteristic um, and then this is a close up of the tree. Um, uh, so the, the owner of the property uh, served a conservation area tree notification on us to remove the tree. Um, the reasons for that, he was concerned it would impact on the, the quality of the grass and the bedding planting he's, he's, he's installed around it. And he felt um, that the bedding planting also enhanced the public uh, amenity of the, of the road. Um, he's objected to the tree preservation order um, uh, and a bit of background history to this, this site is there used to be a walnut tree uh, close to where that white beam is located and we allowed that to be removed in 2009 and it, its removal generated some public concern and that probably weighed uh, heavily when I, when I thought about the removal of this, this white beam, although there were good reasons for the, the removal of the walnut. Um, the objection is based on the fact that in the summer, um, they held the, the residents of the the road held a, a community get together on the the open space which can be seen here um as you can see it's well attended and, and popular and the residents want to do it again um and the end of the tree is concerned that as it grows it could restrict the use of that space um and the ability to be used by the public and he he argues that the the communal value of, of such events is, is at least equal to the amenity value of the tree um uh, he recognises that there was the, the white beams are smaller growing trees than a walnut. He does feel that it will, will gradually impose on, on the use of that, that area. Um, in response to that, I would, I would suggest that white beams, they're, they're a medium sized tree. They can reach 20 metres, but a, a maximum height of 10 to 15 metres is much more common. And the spread of the tree is more modest, um, with a six metre diameter uh, be, being reasonable. Um, and it's a much smaller tree than the, the walnut that it replaced. Um, it's clear the owner has enhanced the grassed area where the tree is located um, through the bedding planting. Um, uh, but we, we, we would argue that the, the tree is still important to the carriage of the road. When we looked at some of those earlier images, a lot of the, the open space and the gardens have, have trees in them. It gives it a certain character. Um, and I believe even if we, if, we, if, if we confirmed the tree preservation order, applications could still be made by the owner to, to prune it. And I think it would be entirely reasonable for us to allow lower branches to be removed to, to ensure the space below the tree could be used by, by members of the, the, the road. Um, 
so all in all, you know, I think the tree does enhance the road and it's not unreasonably large and wouldn't restrict the, the use of this space. And I recommend that the order is confirmed without modification. OK, thank you, Mr. Mr. Pettit. Um, we don't have any speak, guest speakers on this item, so we can go straight into discussion and decision. So would anyone like to uh, start off uh, with this one? Um, uh, uh, Councillor Thomas. Uh, I'd like to move uh, the recommendation, please. Thank you. OK, thank you. And um, that was swift. And do, is there a seconder at this stage for that? Councillor Perdue Horan, thank you. Do you wish to add anything to and make any comments or are we all happy with the report? I mean, Councillor Mason. Thank you. Only that um, I'm pleased to hear that if it does happen that this white thing does grow and I've I have a few friends, and a friend of mine does have a, a white bean in, in her garden. It is quite large, I have to say. It's never been trimmed, I don't think. But it, it would be allowed to be trimmed slightly, right, even with a TPO. You would look at it. We would judge each application on its own merits, but um, we, we do try and be reasonable and, yeah. you know, a bit of pruning, mm. Um, mm. you know. I, I would like to suggest would be appropriate because it is part of the amenity really that they've got there as well if they have this every year this thing so i'm pleased to hear that it can be controlled to a certain extent okay thank you thank you councillor mason and indeed that was the the thought going through my mind as well and indeed paragraph eight does make that that does confirm that that uh, should the owner wish to uh, prune it. It will be. It, it will be obviously, uh, as Mr. Pettit says, each one's done on an individual basis. But uh, the it's allowed for, if appropriate, in the uh, in the order. So I, I suspect there's no one else wanted to speak on this. So shall we uh, go to a vote, please? Those in favour of the recommendation. So I think that's unanimous again. Thank you very much. We're not used to these tree preservation orders, are we, at these meetings? It's quite a new, uh, new experience uh, for, uh, for us, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. So we come on to our third uh, uh, tree preservation order, which is uh, at uh, Hickling, land east of Hickling Road in Hickling. Uh, so Mr. Pettis again, please. Um, we've protected um, a, a belt of trees running along the east side of um, the road, directly north of um, the Hickling Village. Um, it's a group uh, tree preservation order um, where we were required to specify the, the number and type of tree. So um, you can see from the plan, we've, we've gone into some detail and shown which trees are protected and indicated which some that are not. Uh, the trees are early mature. They're a mixed species, including ash, oak, alder and poplar. They're estimated to be around 25 years old. Um, and within the belt, there's some native shrubs that we, we haven't protected. So the trees in question are on the, the right hand side of the road. And you can see the last um, bungalow in the village on, on the right there. And then this is looking again, um, the view out of the village as you leave to the north. And again, the, the trees you can see on the right hand side are protected, as are the two trees between the telegraph poles. Um, uh, this is looking back into the village, just to sort of show the, the view back in uh, and, and how they, they enhance the, the road. Um, and that gives a, an overall impression of their, their height. Um, these are, this is the northern uh, trees in the group, uh, two poplars that we've protected. And I think to the right, there's, some, uh, there's a silver birch and ash, which are again shown in this, this, this picture. Um, eagle-eyed amongst you might see a dead tree in the middle that's that's not protected um, and as we move down down the group um, we've got poplars and and, and uh, ash and then this is the southern edge of the group where we've got um, a group of alder and an oak tree and you can just see the bungalow on, on the right hand side um, the tpo was made as a result of a planning application to construct um, a barn and car parking uh, space for a egg vending machine uh, this was refused um, uh, for, for a number of reasons, um, including the impact it would have on the, um, the character of the countryside, um, uh, and it was felt the design, location, and use was neither justified or proportional. We also recognised that it would it would remove a number of trees. 
Um, an arbor report accompanied the application, uh, which assessed the quality of the trees uh, with a view to developing the site. Um, unfortunately, the application didn't really make the best use of this, this tree survey. Um, the trees weren't plotted on the, the layout drawings. Um, and whilst the, the tree survey said there was ample opportunity for the implementation of new planting, uh, this wasn't adequately demonstrated in the, the application. Uh, an objection has been received by uh, Maver Jamie acting on behalf of the, the landowner. Um, they argue that the TPO is a retaliatory strike to those wishing to bar sustainable development and employment in the countryside. Um, they've also gone through the tree survey and, and picked out some comments regarding the, the various types of trees were protected. So they suggest the alder are in different quality and potential. The ash has early signs of ash dieback. Uh, the birch is of low value and the poplars are a typical species and therefore not valuable. Um, they argue six of the protected ash are likely to die from ash dieback um, and they should be dismissed from the tree preservation order as they will need to be removed to aid the reduction and spread of the disease and on public safety grounds. Uh, the objector does not believe in the overall impact and quality uh, of the group. Um, the objection disputes the amenity value of the trees. Uh, they weren't planted for that purpose. Um, uh, they were planted 15 to 20 years ago in an area of poor agricultural land and not for the uh, amenity enhancement. Uh, they argue the TPO should be dismissed, but they would be happy to accept a TPO on the single oak tree, which is uh, the tree closest to the bungalow, the, the one in the right, uh, sort of hiding behind that, that telegraph pole. Um, I, I would like to reassure the landowner this, this was not a retaliatory strike in response to the planning application. We have a duty to consider trees when considering planning applications and a duty to protect them when we consider they enhance the public realm and there's a, a potential risk to them. Uh, the vast majority of our tree preservation orders uh, are made as a result of planning applications and it's entirely appropriate for us to make a TPO response in, in response to a planning application, particularly where trees are not currently protected and there's a, a likelihood of refusal. Um, the, the, the accuracy of some of the comments allocated to some of the species is fair, but the, the, the tree survey uh, went into much more detail. So, for example, um, um, in relation to the, the alders, they said uh, the edge trees are larger and better specimens and would succeed as standalone specimens, whilst the internal ones are of indifferent quality and potential. As a result, the council only protected four out of the nine alders die back at the current time so we protected six out of the eight ash trees on the site um, uh, the report the arbor cultural report uh, notes in relation to the Lombardy poplars that they are mixed condition with the two largest trees on the edge of the field t23 and t24 being good overall condition these were the two trees that the council chose to protect um, it also makes reference to the birch having poor form due to a symmetry over the farmland. But given the, the nature of this sort of shelter belt planting, we didn't feel that was, was strictly un, unreasonable. Um, scenarios predict that more than 95% of all ash will be killed by the, the disease. Uh, and there's no need to preemptively fell ash because the, the disease has spread across the country. And there's still hope of finding trees uh, with some genetic tolerance to the to the disease. Um, I did consider whether or not the ash should be protected given the increasing prevalence of the disease. Um, the first part is, is dieback in the upper canopy uh, and there's an exemption under the tree preservation order that allows the removal of dead branches. So any dieback could be removed without having to make an application to us. There's also an exemption that relates to dead or dangerous trees. Um, and I believe we would allow the removal of the trees before they became dangerous. Uh, the advantage of the tree preservation order is it allows, it would place the, the owner under a duty to plant replacements. Uh, the group tree preservation order is selective and specifies the best quality trees. Um, but it does recommend that individually some trees are of lower quality. Um, however, TPOs are used to protect trees where, they, where it is expedient in the interest of amenity. Amenity is not defined in law. But government advice is that TPO should be used to protect selected trees and woodlands if their removal would have a significant negative impact on the local environment and its enjoyment by the public. 
trees, at least part of them, should normally be visible from the road. Uh, we, I feel these trees clearly meet that, that criteria. They are a prominent feature on the edge of the village. Um, the council does have the option to modify the TPO if we choose to confirm it, so we could protect less trees uh, than we have done. However, it should be borne in mind that the value of the trees is of the linear roadside group, and protecting a single oak would mean that there's a risk that the other trees could be removed and not replaced. So therefore, I recommend that the, the tree preservation order is confirmed without modification. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pettit. And uh, as you've heard, there has been, a, a, again, a, an objection to this tree order, and we have got a speaker on this. Um, so, Mr. Parker, are you with us? And I'm not sure if you were here earlier, but you've got up to five minutes to uh, to talk to the committee. And uh, as soon as you're ready, the, uh, the right-hand button on the microphone. OK, thank you. Councillors. Um, afternoon. My name is Michael Parker. I manage Sherwood Farms, the owner of the trees in question. Um, we've noted and reviewed and the report provided by the planning officers. However, we maintain our objection to the pre tree preservation order and that a number of assumptions and conclusions the officer has made in making the recommendation we feel are incorrect. As just mentioned, the planning history of the site has been referenced we applied for planning to install an egg vending machine and associated infrastructure on the site. This application was to support our existing poultry enterprise and provide additional facilities to the village of Hickling, which is without a shop of any nature. Although that application is not being considered, it is referenced in the report relating to this TPO. We object to this being the forum or method that the planning officers have taken if they have concerns about the vending machine and that the officers should have made reference or comment to the tree protection during that application. We as landowners could have dealt with the issues or concerns raised by the planning officers and provided a solution to any issues. It is noted in the officer's report to this committee that the application did little to consider the agricultural report appended to the application. We would like to suggest that the officer revisit the application and make the necessary amendments to their report. As referenced in the report, the landowner can provide additional tree planting over Sherwood Farms. In fact, we plant many trees every year already land hold, in our land holding, but detail was not requested during the vending machine application. And again, it is suggested that the planning officer refers to the landowner and the previous planning application rather than raise it in this forum. The officer notes that the trees could have been felled at any time. We refer to the Forestry Act of 1967, which limits the quantity of timber that can be removed from in the holding. It is noted within the Act that in order to fell trees, a felling licence is required. I am therefore not allowed to remove trees unless in conjunction with a felling licence. We do not have a felling licence at current. It is also worth noting that any felling licence has mandatory requirements for restocking of felled trees. The officer states that the TPO will give the councillors greater opportunities to ensure replacement trees. This is already covered under a felling licence to which we fall under, and we question why the officer did not suggest replanting as a condition to the vending machine application instead of the TPO. The TPO is expected to ensure the better quality, ensure protection of better quality trees. With reference to the agricultural survey provided during the application, it is noted that none of the trees are of good quality and many are dying. If the goal of a TPO is to ensure protection of trees of significant quality, then I would argue that a TPO, the tree preservation order should be dismissed. A number of trees within the TPO are suffering from ash dieback disease. As mentioned, it's expected to kill 95% of the country's trees. According to the report, the TPO did not seek to protect ash trees where signs of dieback are more advanced. This is not correct, and we urge the members to refer to this survey, which was provided to the officer. All of the trees included in the tree protection order are currently suffering from ash dieback disease. Given the location of the trees, I am concerned that they could possibly become dangerous in the coming years. It is inevitable that the trees will need to be felled at some point in the future, but I again refer to the need of a felling license which would require tree replanting should we get to that point. The TPO appears to be pointless in relation to the trees which are suffering from ash dieback. 
The officer acknowledges in the report that a number of the trees are suffering from the disease and are unlikely to survive. Given this acknowledgement, it appears to me that the TPO is wholly irrelevant on these trees. All other trees, excluding the ash, are referred to in the arboricultural survey are considered of low value, which the trees, which are the trees the TPO is seeking to protect. Given the nature of the TPO, it is to protect trees of significant value. This order, again, quest the given the nature of the TPO, it is to protect trees of significant value. This order again question the definition of significant is important and worthy of attention i question whether any party driving along this road has given much attention to the trees noted under the tpo under point 12 of the report part of the group of trees we acknowledge is visible from the public highway the officer seeks to state that they are in a prominent location within the village given that the village's boundary is 300 meters from the site i argue that the site cannot be considered in any way a prominent location within the village that's your time Okay, thank you. Uh, no uh, bang on five minutes, so thanks very much for that. Could you just turn the switch off? Oh, that's great. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, right, so uh, that, that was Mr. Parker, uh, uh, who's speaking against, is, is the owner of the trees and is against the, uh, the preservation order. Um, Mr. Petty, can you help uh, re respond to some of the observations there? For in particular, the um, uh, Mr. Parker referred to the felling license and. Uh, 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 and uh, would need to could could reply for or apply for fresh planting, for example. And he and he again makes a point that some of the trees are are dying anyway, and uh, there is ash dieback in in in, uh, in in some of the trees. And also he made the point about uh, worries about safety and danger near the road, for example. So, thank you. Yeah. So um, a felling license is required from the Forestry Commission if you wish to fell um, over three cubic metres of wood per calendar quarter. So small scale felling could take place um, under that exemption without the need for a felling license. If, if as a landowner you want to do large scale works, yes, you would require a felling license. I didn't catch if you, you had one or, or, or didn't. Sorry, no, you didn't. didn't. OK. Um, I, I, it's a valid point about the ash they are likely to die um, over the, the next few years. Um, as I said in the report, you know, I considered it uh, could be advantageous to protect them, A, because removal of the trees under the dead or dangerous exemption would allow a place of duty to, to replace them. And I, I want to ensure the, uh, the retention of this belt. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's something that the, the councillors have to discuss. Um, and what was the, the, the final point? Um, there, was, there was mention about the worry about them being potentially dangerous, and um, especially because they're, they're fairly near the verge in the road. Yeah. So the, the disease is fairly slow acting. Uh, the first stage is, is die back in the, the outer branches, which are, are quite small. Uh, you wouldn't even need to remove them, but you know, you, you could do. There's an exemption for removing dead branches. What will happen is the, the tree will increasingly, the, the foliage in the canopy will increasingly die back, it will weaken the tree, and it, it does open them up in, in late stages of the disease to other fungal infection. We wouldn't want to retain ash trees to the point where it's a danger to the public or, or the, the tree surgeon's task with removal. So there is a dead or dangerous exemption. So the, the landowner could come to me and say, look, we feel the trees have got to the point where they should be removed. Um, we could allow their removal. The a duty to plant a replacement, um, but we wouldn't be expecting the trees to be retained to a point where they're, they're dangerous. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, uh, I think that's, that's uh, responded to Mr. Parker's point. So, um, um, do we have any comments or questions on this one, Councillor Bailey? Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Bailey and then Councillor Healy. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I know this stretch of road really quite well. And it is correct to say that a lot of the ash trees in the vicinity have died back and some of them are definitely dead. As you come from Knowlton on the right hand side, there's a whole row of them, probably half a dozen trees. And I did actually count between Knowlton and Hickling, just as driving along, 60 de dead or dying ash trees. So in a way that makes it all the more important to actually put a TPO on, on the trees that are alive or will continue, we hope, in terms of older oak 
Um, and what was the other one? Because obviously ash dieback is very prevalent at the moment. So in a way, um, to me, this is really quite an important bank of trees. As you come along Canolton towards Hickling, it's very, it, it actually breaks up the skyline. You <clears throat> Rather than just having everything at hedge height, and actually I do think they may not be the best quality trees, but I do actually think they serve a purpose within the public domain, and it is, it is very much... Um, I think important that we do keep these. And if there were to, these individual trees were to die back, mm -hmm. that if there was a TPO, it means that we could require them, um, to landowners, to actually replace with suitable trees. So actually, I'm quite in favour of, I am in favour of, of, of having a TPO on these trees. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bailey. Um, uh, are, are you in effect moving the recommendation or? I'm happy to move the recommendation. Right. Okay. Uh, thank. Thank you. We've got that. So, um, uh, Councillor Healy, you wanted to speak as well on this. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just clarification, really. There was a lot of numbers in the presentation, um, and perhaps just for my benefit and the benefit of of the committee, how many trees are we talking about in total? What did, what was our starting number? And I get the impression that perhaps all have not got a TPO at the moment. Uh, but please clarify. I think we I believe we've protected 14 trees in the group, and you're correct, not all the trees are protected. We, we were very selective, um, so uh, not all the ash, not all the older are protected. The understory, you know, the native shrubs, uh, wild rose, for example, they're not trees, so we've not protected those. I think we've probably protected the bare minimum to try and maintain a, a tree-lined frontage to the road. and. Obviously, the trees that are not protected, the landowner can prune and manage as he sees fit without having to seek our permission. Okay, uh, that was going to be my follow-on. You said prune or or whatever, but he can't remove them. Or can he? he can remove trees that are not covered. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Right. yeah. Just yeah. needed to know. That. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Stockwood and then Councillor Thomas. Thank you. I think the point that really resonates with me in this report is uh, on page 36, number 11. Uh, there's no need to preemptively fell ash to control the spread of the disease as it is now present across the country. But there is the hope of finding trees with some genetic tolerance. And I really think that should be the main point we take from this uh, report. It is important with this disease, ash disease to try and find this. And if we can do some things in a small way on this band of trees, in the hope that one of them does, you know, give some indication of that, it would be wonderful. So I'm happy to actually second the recommendation. To okay, thank thing. you, Councillor Stockwood. And Councillor Thomas, you wanted to comment as well. Um, Yes, um, obviously an egg vending could be a, a huge benefit in this, this location. Um, I'm just wondering, um, um, should the application come back, um, is it possible for <clears throat> it to succeed and the be removed, which, um, you know, um, despite the fact that they've got a TPO. Thank you. Did you get that, uh, Mr. Petter? Did you? The TPO yeah. would be a material planning consideration if it goes to appeal or if a, a resubmission is, is submitted to us. Um, you, you can see, you know, that there's there's a group of trees at the very sub, southern edge of the site that we've protected, and there's there's some gaps in the middle. So I, I wouldn't like to say what the future holds, but you know, we would we would. Uh, work with the applicant any future application I, I i think i think probably what you're you're saying there is is whatever if an application comes in for whatever it's like any application it's looked at on an individual uh, pluses and minuses of whatever that application is which may or may not happen is is that's basically what we're we're saying isn't it right okay right um Right. So, uh, Councillor Bailey has has moved the rec this recommendation as per the, as per the report, and Councillor Stockwood has seconded it. Uh, it's. Um, do, does anyone else wish to say anything, or are we going to? Uh, Councillor Price. 
Um, yeah, just a quick question um, on the issue of tree quality, because that was um, uh, an issue um, in the objection. Um, what criteria do you apply when assessing the quality of the tree and determining whether a TPO is appropriate? So, so there's a number of factors. Um, the, the, the survey, um, in accordance with the British standard, places the, the trees in four categories. So you've got A for your best quality trees, category B, which are moderate, category C, which are of low value, uh, and category U, which is a tree that's not really got any future life potential and could be removed, whatever the situation. All the trees that we've protected are category B, so the moderate, or category C, which is low quality. Uh, we've, we've protected categories A, B, and C on, on numerous planning applications. Obviously, uh, the survey is written with a view to a develop, development proposal. When we consider a tree preservation order, we're primarily looking at the, the public amenity value of the tree. Of the public, do they enhance the public realm? Um, and you know, these aren't the same trees that we've been looking at in the the, the, the two other uh, TPOs we considered, which were trees, you know, standing within a garden. This is very much a shelter belt on the edge of an agricultural field in a rural location. So um, the trees are of a different quality. They've grown together closely, but they still have that value to the public because they're, they're visible as you leave and enter the village. Is that helpful? OK, right. Um, I think we've, we've covered the points on, on this one. And, and, uh, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's a balancing act, isn't it, on uh, and, and, um, whether we're talking about planning applications or tree preservation orders. But I think we need to make a decision on this. So uh, we've got the recommendation in front of us as per the report moved and seconded. Um, show of hands, please, for those in favour of the recommendation. Yeah. OK, and that's, uh, that's that's unanimous again. So but I think we've we've learned some interesting uh, um, uh, points and advice from uh, the process as well in this in this uh, application. So thank you. So just do a bit of chair moving. And uh, right, so oh, we have to put your badge on, very important. <laughs> so uh, we'll come on to our, uh, uh, first of our uh, uh, more, more traditional planning applications now. And this is uh, 92 Davis Road, West Bridgeford, a rear single storey extension and a two storey side extension above existing garage. And uh, Rachel, Miss Gaskell, you're going to do this for us there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Right, excuse my, oh, there we go. Sorry. So this application relates to 92 Davis Road, a traditional detached dwelling located within an established residential area. The aerial photograph showing it within, um, yeah, the traditional road of properties. The character of the surrounding area is predominantly detached and semi-detached dwellings, many of which have been altered and extended, including the two immediate neighbours. This is the um, this is the property, 92 Davis Road. Oh, rear garden, side some more rear garden. That is one of the neighbours, number 94 and uh, number 90. Views of their extensions. This is the front of number 90, and you can see it's had a side dormer on there. And then these are properties on the opposite side of Davis Road, which have been extended, just showing the character, as I say, of the area. So the application is seeking full planning permission for the erection of single storey side and rear extensions and their first floor and two storey side extension partially above the existing attached garage. That's the block plan. So the darker colour showing where the additional floor space would be or footprint would be. Um, let me show you the there's existing plans and these are the proposed plans. So overall, the proposed extensions would provide updated and enlarged living accommodation, but there would be no actual increase in the number of bedrooms at the property. The extensions would be constructed of materials to match the existing dwelling. So the main considerations in the assessment of this proposal are design and appearance, 
and residential amenity. So with regards to design and appearance, um, we have received an objection from Councillor Gowland, which on the grounds of massing, as the proposal would be built up to the shared boundary with 90 Davis Road, and concern is also raised about turning Westbridge for into terraced housing. So as I stated before, how do I go? Sorry, how do I go back? Oh, ah, you'll get some. So, as I stated before, Davis Road is made up of an assortment of detached and semi detached houses, many of which have been altered and extended to varying degrees. So, um, so when we've considered the relevant policies and guidance within the character of the along with the character of the wider area, it is the officer's opinion that the proposed first floor and two storage side extension, I'll go back to the, um, sorry, the proposed plans. Um, with the proposed setback, which is approximately 0.25 metres, 25 centimetres from the main front elevation, along with the use of render to complement the existing front bay on the upper section of that side extension and the substantial set down of 0.65 metres from the ridge side of the host dwelling would be sufficient to ensure a subordinate appearance of this side extension. In addition to the proposed side extension having a subordinate appearance, visual spacing as required by the Rushcliffe Residential Design Guide is maintained by way of the presence of pedestrian access to each side of the dwelling. And this can be seen on, best on the block plan there. I don't know if I can zoom in. Oh, I might have spilled everything here, sorry. If we zoom in, there we go. So we can see on either side of the property, there is pedestrian access maintained to ensure that visual space. In addition to the side extension, there's a single story rear extension, which would be of an appropriate design and scale and would not be clearly visible from the public realm. So when considering residential amenity, the other key factor, officers have concluded that the proposals would not result in any significant adverse impact by virtue of overbearing impact, loss of light or overlooking to neighbouring properties. It should be noted that no letters of representation from neighbouring properties have been received. So to conclude, it is officer's opinion that the proposal would be acceptable in amenity terms and would not be detrimental to visual amenity or the character of the wider area. Recommendation is therefore to approve subject to relevant conditions. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Um, we don't have any, any guest speakers on this item either, so we can go straight into a discussion and decision. So I want to start off with, uh, with this one, Councillor Mason and then Councillor Thomas. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, where you uh, say, oh, on that slide, it does look, except for on the right and the first floor, um, that they can access the front of the house from, from the back on both sides. Is that what you said? If I come back, yes. sorry, I'll come back in. Yeah. No, from yeah. that there is um, uh, the the visual spacing is there's just a is maintained. There's a gap. There's so gap the, the neighbouring property has pedestrian access. Right. The application property has pedestrian access. Sorry, I um, I just um, yeah misunderstood that because um, I thought that, that can't that can't be it. But there is um, a gap on the left hand side as we're looking at that now. Uh, yeah, and and that there is a setback to that. that, shows, that shows, yeah. Yes, 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 that yes. So yeah. uh, that's what I couldn't understand. I was looking at that, and I thought, well, yeah, okay. Um, so I can't see that there is particularly any chance of it being thought of as ter as terracing. I know that on. Um, one road in uh, West Bridgeford off um, Boundary Road, I forget which one it was. There weren't any houses that were um, right up to the boundary on any size, and it, it was uh, a sort of a policy that we didn't do that. But 
Um, that has changed now on that road, and this looks um, the same. So I can't see that there's any particular interest in the idea of looking at it as terracing. So at the moment, I can't see that um, it's terracing. The extension on one side, as you say, is set back. Um, the one, the front, uh, the one at the rear is also um, at the bottom. It is, yeah, yeah. It's, it's also slightly offset. Are, are, you, are you referring to number? The next door, where where is which, which would be ninety four, where there appeared to be a, an extension, Partly, yes. which goes yes. further into yes. that garden so, of that's four and ninety two. Yes. Yeah. So um, I don't particularly have any objection to it. It is the same as quite a few houses along that road. So I can't see that it could be causing a terracing effect. Therefore, I have no objections. Um, if the chairman wants me to, I'll propose some um, acceptance of it. But if we can, I can always uh, listen to some other people who want to speak. It's not a question of the chairman wanting you to. It's entirely up to you if you wish to. All right, uh, then. Well, to, I'll, to, uh, I'll do it in the first uh, place. And then it's up so to are you yes. formally moving the recommendation? I am formally moving the right, recommendation the to accept. Right, OK. So, well, before we go any further with that, I know Councillor Thomas wanted to speak. So do you want to come in at this point, Councillor Thomas? Um, yes, I was just going to ask the officer, please, to um, um, cover off the question um, from the ward member with the query whether the neighbours would provide access to build the wall. Given that the extension goes all the way up to the boundary, how is that managed in terms of the building and um, later on? Thank you. No, that's a very understandable question uh, because of the proximity of, of the neighbouring property and uh, maintenance, etc. So uh, uh, what, what can we say about that? Um, as, it, as is outlined in the report, that is a private legal matter and isn't something that we can refuse a planning permission on. So that's, that's a very brief and succinct answer uh, as to the legal situation is it's a civil matter between the, the different uh, the re residences. Um, right, uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Chairman. I th am I correct in thinking you've had no objections to this planning application from, from neighbours in the vicinity? Well, I think that's very telling. Um, and also, when you showed us the photographs of how so many of the houses have been extended, and actually, I think, very sympathetically, so um, I would be happy to second um, Councillor Mason's uh, recommendation that, that uh, we accept this planning application. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Bailey. So we've had the recommendation moved and seconded. Um, I, just, I don't think there's anyone else wishing to speak on this. So shall we make a decision? Um, so a show of hands in favour, please show. And that appears to be unanimous. So, and yes, no one against. So, thank you very much. Yes, Davis Road is interesting. I mean, like a lot of people, I, I go up and do, down Davis Road a lot. And uh, and the, the mixture of house types, and you can see the number that's been extended and altered. And, and it's, uh, but no, I think that's, that's, that's fine. Anyway, um, right, more musical chairs. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll come on to our next application, which is 50, 59 Dunster Road, West Bridgeford. This is the demolition of an existing garage, single storey rear and side extension. Extended raised patio to the rear, a loft conversion, including a side hip to gable and rear, rear dormer. And uh, Mr. Bridges, over to you, please. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Chair, uh, and good afternoon, members. Um, so, two late representations have been received in which have been circulated to members. Uh, so, I hope you have all received them. Um, as the Chairman just said, this application relates to the demolition of the existing garage, a uh, single storey 
side and rear extension, an extended raised patio and loft extensions, including a side hip to gable extension and a rear box dormer. So the application property is located in the Abbey Ward of West Bridgeford on the northeast side of Dunster Road. The property itself is a two storey dwelling of which is one of an attractive symmetrical semi-detached pier. The dwelling consists of a hip roof, a large chimney stack and a feature front projecting gable which overhangs a two storey bay window. <clears throat> it's predominantly finished in brick with secondary elements of white smooth render whilst the roof is finished in a red brown rosemary tile with ridge tiles. To the rear, the application site has a detached garage adjacent to the northwest boundary with 57 Dunster Road, a raised patio which extends to the rear of that detached garage and a lengthy rear lawn. So the rear garden shares side boundaries with 57 and 61 Dunster Road and 60 Rodney Road uh, to the rear boundary. The majority of properties in the area are of a similar age and style um, as seen here with the application property on the left. Um, although several properties within the area have been previously altered with an effect on the street scene. Uh, so this includes hip to gable extensions, side dormers, front roof lights, um, and multiple pro properties uh, within the vicinity, which are newer. Uh, and of different age, ages uh, do have gabled roof forms. Um, so to recap, it is proposed for the demolition of the existing garage, a single storey side and rear wraparound extension, an extended patio, a loft conversion facilitated through a hip to gable extension, a rear dormer, a new second floor window and front roof lights. So these are the existing plans. And um, so they're the look at location plans and then just um, some 3D models of the proposed. So the single storey side and rear extension would wrap around the rear corner of the site. So the, the, this left hand corner over here, um, such that it would appear as a lean to side extension when viewed from the front. So in the top right image. Um, or well, from the back, it would have the, the two the two gables. Um, it would extend alongside but inset from the boundary with number 57 um, at a length to be to the rear of where the existing garage is um, and adjacent to the other boundary. So on the right hand side of this roof plan uh, is stepped to uh, four metres in length and a further 3.4 metres beyond that. Um, beyond the rear of these extensions, it's proposed for a raised terrace that would extend further to the rear than the existing raised terrace by three metres, but the whole of the raised terrace would be 40 centimetres slower than the existing. In order to aid overlooking concerns of this raised terrace, uh, particularly on the boundary with um, number 61, the existing brick wall um, would be infilled between the columns with a fence in and on uh, the boundary of 57 there would be an additional uh, fence in to a height of two meters from the patio. The hip to gable extension would maintain the existing ridge height, eaves height and roof pitch as the existing such that it would appear as one continuous roof plane with roof tiles to match the existing. The new gable wall on the side elevation would be finished in a brick to match the existing and the chimney would be retained. The rear dormer would be of a flat roof design and finished in a vertical hung tile to match the host dwelling and the dorm would have a flat GRP roof system. Um, the dormer would include a French door set inside of two fixed windows um, behind a frosted Juliet balcony. And the roof works would also see the insertion of three front facing roof lights and one obscure glazed side window. Uh, as set out in the committee report, 
The main planning considerations relevant to this application are the principle of development, design and impacts on the character of the area and impacts on neighbour amenity. Um, so with regards to the principle of development, uh, the development proposes household or extensions to an established residential property within the West Bridgeford area and accordingly the principle of these works in this location is acceptable. So in terms of the design and the impacts on the area, there are no significant, significant concerns with regards to the single storey side and rear wraparound extension, given that the elements visible from public domain would be well set back from the front elevation and the single storey. Um, so although concerns have been raised with regards to the hip to gable extension, Officers consider the extension to be acceptable, given that it remains an element of balance with its attached neighbour through the retention of key features, including the front facing gable, the large chimney stack, whilst maintaining the eaves height, ridge height, roof pitch and materials as the existing property and its neighbour. It was worth noting that, as mentioned in the site description, uh, multiple properties have been extended in a similar way. And um, it's also worth noting that a hip to gable, which concerns have been raised regarding, could be completed under permitted development up to 50 cubic metres in volume, and the hip to gable would be 27 cubic metres, um, so well within. And as, as such, officers have no significant, significant concerns as a result of the hip to gable extension. The proposed flat roof rear dormer would not be easily visible from public domain, given that it would be located to the rear of the dwelling, inset from the eaves, set down from the ridge and finished in materials to match. Uh, the front facing roof lights and second floor side window are considered to be quite typical for the area. Um, concerns have been raised with regards to the cumulative effect of the extensions um, and it's noted that it would be a notable increase in footprint, but the application property would retain a rear garden significantly greater than the residential design guide re requires, and the existing parking arrangement would not be unduly altered. So with regards to residential amenity, um, so it's appreciated that the proposed side slash rear extension would be of a significant length alongside the boundary with number 57. But given that the extension would be facilitated through the removal of the existing garage, uh, so to the right of the left picture, um, and the garage that's there at the moment has a greater eaves and ridge height than the proposal. And as such, there are no significant overbearing or overshadowing concerns. And due to being located to the north of the attached neighbor, so behind the picture as uh, on the left or to the right of the picture on the right. Um, it stepped in from the boundary after four metres and as such there's no significant concerns. The outlook of the extension and the raised terrace would be predominantly contained within the existing and proposed site boundaries in terms of the side neighbours and given the length of the gardens being approximately four to five metres uh, to the rear neighbours with vegetation at the foot of the garden, as you can see in the right hand side image, uh, there are no significant overlooking concerns. The proposed boundary treatments on the southeast boundary would include the insertion of infill fencing um, between the brick columns, as mentioned. Um, it is noted that the height would not increase, as I understand concerns were raised. The height would not increase, but just in filling the gap of the columns. Uh, and as such, it is not considered to be significantly overbearing and whilst being located to the north of the attached neighbour, therefore not any significant overshadowing concerns. It's proposed for the extension of the existing fence on the boundary of number 57, so the left of the right hand side neighbour. Um, uh, it would only extend three metres and be significantly lower than the ex existing detached garage and as such there are no significant concerns. The rear box dormer would be sited on the northeast facing roof plane 
and as such there are no potential overshadowing impacts on 50 so there are potential overshadowing impacts apologies uh, but given that it would be sub subordinate to the roof plane being set down from the ridge and inset from the eaves there are no significant concerns it is noted that the dormer would include a significant amount of glazing through a French door and two full height windows set behind an obscure glazed balcony, uh, Juliet balcony apologies, uh, but given the oblique views available from the Juliet balcony, the patio areas immediately to the rear of the two side neighbouring properties would not be significantly overlooked. It is noted that the rear neighbours of Rodney Road would experience an uh, increased level of overlooking, um, but due to there already being a dormer on each of the side neighbours and the 52 metre distance from the dormer to the rear elevation of the, the neighbours on Rodney Road, there are no significant overlooking concerns. Um, so that's it with regards to neighbour amenity, um, but I just would like to mention car parking and trees. Um, so the existing property is a four bedroom dwelling and as a result of the proposed extensions, the dwelling would be five bedrooms. And as such, this is still within the same requirement of car parking as the existing dwelling. No notable alterations to the existing car parking arrangements are proposed, given that the existing garage would not appear to adhere to car parking standards. Um, the, with regards to trees, the proposed extension would be within proximity of a tree in the neighbouring garden uh, of the attached property and the extension could be likely to affect the health of the tree. Um, however, as Tom mentioned earlier, Tom put it, um, when roots or overhanging branches uh, come over the boundary, that's more of a private legal matter and shouldn't stop any, any, any planning application. Um, so in conclusion, having assessed the development proposal against relevant local and national policies, the proposal is considered acceptable on balance and it is therefore recommended that planning permission be granted, subject to conditions outlined in the committee report. Thank you. Uh, we, we have speakers on this item. Um, the, we have the applicant and also a neighbouring objector. So first of all, Mr Broxholm, if you're here, if you'd like to come and talk to us. And uh, you've got up to five minutes to uh, address the committee. And uh, as soon as you're ready, press the right button. Red, yeah, the red light will come on. If you're still speaking after four and a half, we'll let you know there's 30 seconds left. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Broxham. I'm the applicant and I live at number 59 Dunster Road for over 32 years now. The road is an eclectic collection of different homes and has changed over, the per over that period, with some being altered in the similar way as my application, like number 56, which has been completed, number 48, which has been permi perm permission has been granted. My, my home needs this application to enable me to update the house to a more modern way of living and, wor and my working from home. It includes making use of the old garage, which currently is accommodated as a storage unit. I started this application back in 20, 2021 and altered it numerous times to help accommodate my neighbour's concerns. I have discussed this with both neighbours, with now number 57 having no objections to the extension. Over the time, I have had a number of visits by the planning officers, sorry if I repeat what the planning officer said, who have seen right firsthand the site and all the issues raised and cleared them up in their report. I have also considered, I have always considered the age and features of the house and intend to keep them intact during my project. I would like to mention that I have gone through multiple design changes with my architect under the guidance of the planning officers and to try to omit any proposed issue, issues with the boundary affecting my neighbours. One being with the composite and side, side setback compromise, sorry, one being that we have compromised and set back the scale of the extension on the boundary of number 61 under the planner's guidance by some 3.5 metres, reducing to, to what I would like, what I would have liked. Further to which we have also lowered the patio from the existing proposal with some which was submitted in 2021, compromising the impact on my neighbours. 
both mine and my neighbour's garden suffer from a change in elevation at the rear, which means we will always have a height issue. We have attempted to spread the elevation changes gradually to keep it safe and avoid any drops immediately outside my doorways and reduce any need for railing. What you may also see is that uh, we have maintained the original boundary wall and only infilled where we feel privacy is sens sensible to be maintained. Consider this, considering there is also a tree on the same boundary of my neighbor's side, covers most of the already issues with overlooking. You can probably see that in the picture. I consider myself fortunate to live in the home with such large gardens, 100 foot long, and this application will enable me more access to enjoy. I have made significant changes to accommodate my neighbours and planning officer during the during this process and would ask the committee to grant as per the planner's recommendations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well within your five minutes. So uh, thank you for that. Um, our next speaker on this is Mr Stockdale who is speaking to object to the application so well put, put uh, yeah. yeah so as you as you know you've got up to five minutes to to speak to us and uh, whenever you're ready you can hit the button and your red light will come on thank you good afternoon today uh sorry my name's justin i live at number 61 and uh, today I represent a group of neighbours from Dunster Road and Rodney Road, all of whom are going to be affected by this development. We want to be clear that we're not seeking to prevent the proposed development entirely. We recognise that Andrew has a right to extend his property. However, we are disappointed that officers have been unable to secure the relatively minor changes we have suggested to prevent the development having an unacceptable impact on our amenities. Furthermore, we do not feel that the committee report before you fairly reflects these concerns or the suggestions we have made with respect to modifications and legitimate planning concerns. Firstly, to the key issues affecting the homes either side of this property. Firstly, I refer you to the image on page one of the letter you have been sent from ourselves, um, which shows the proposed extension and raised patio areas in three dimensions extending eight metres to the rear of 61 Dunster Road and abutting the boundary. The patio is approximately one metre higher than the garden level of 61 Dunster Road. As a result, it would have a significant adverse overlooking impact on our private amenity space. Whilst boundary screening could amel ameliorate the privacy issue, Due to the level difference, it would create a significant overbearing impact on the amenity space to the rear of the property, likely to be around three metres. This is illustrated by the highlighted photograph on page two of the letter. For 57 Dunster Road, the extended patio is between one and 0.6 metres above the level of the garden of number 57. The additional screening also results in an exceptionally high and overbearing area of fencing, three metres in height and three metres in length, extending beyond the existing garage into the garden. Simple solutions to this that would provide a fair and reasonable outcome to both ourselves and the applicant. Remove the patio in the blue shaded areas adjacent to 61 Dunster Road. The raised boundary fencing would then not be required and the overbearing, overshadowing impact would be reduced. For the boundary adjoining 57 Dunster Road, they propose reducing the height above the patio from 2 to 1.9 metres, the height of the existing fencing, and to grade the fence to follow the patio steps downwards. For our neighbours on Roddy Road, the key issue they would like to highlight are those around the impact of privacy arising from the loss conversion element of the works, which are exasperated by the elevation of Dunster Road above Rodney Road. The proposal allows an uninterrupted view from the proposed loft extension into the ground floor and garden of 60 Rodney Road with a detrimental effect to the residents' amenity and enjoyment of the property. They would suggest to retain the hip style roof maintaining the symmetry with number 61, permit only windows and no doors as these create a focal point for viewing, reduce the amount of glazing by over 30%, which would be partially obscured from waste to floor. 
Finally, while in the eyes of the council, the cherry tree in the garden of 61 isn't of significant value. It is something that is valued greatly by the family, as well as being a key feature of our garden. It also provides privacy for our neighbours on Rodney Road, and we're convinced that this could be negatively impacted by the build. It is a haven for wildlife with nesting squirrels and birds, has the most incredible blossom in spring. In, spring. in short, we love the tree and it would be a huge blow for us to lose it. It should be a condition of construction that this tree is protected. The planning officer report would seem to indicate that each element should be approved and that similar work has been undertaken elsewhere. However, the report does not appear to be looking at the combination of all the changes and how they impact the original property in producing a very different building and landscaping from the existing one and the impact on neighbouring properties. As a group of neighbours, we request that a decision on the application is deferred and invite members to either view the issues on site or request officers to seek further modifications to the proposals to overcome the issues we've outlined. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Stockdale. Just, just in time again, so uh, thank you for that. Um, we also have a, uh, a representation from one of the ward members, uh, Councillor Goland, who is not with us today, but she's sent a represent uh, her representation in to be read out. So. The, the solicitor will read that out on behalf of Councillor Goland. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I have so many issues with the application and with the committee report, but I will stick to two points here. First, the report says, paragraph 33, the flat roof rear dormer would not easily be visible from the public domain. This assumes that back gardens are not public domain. I feel this is no longer true as these types of roof extensions turned all neighbouring gardens and even bedrooms into public space, intruding on many people's privacy and also completely changing their built environment and sense of place. As a general point, when houses are so close together and regularly in suburban streets, why aren't back gardens considered public space if not public domain? If a resident had historically engaged in topless bathing in their previously private back garden, and now suddenly is overlooked by one of these huge roof extensions, would they now be considered to be acting indecently? I'm not being flippant. I'm trying to illustrate how the nature of the back gardens of West Bridgeford are being altered. Personally, during lockdown, I followed Joe Wick's fitness videos from my back garden. I certainly would not have done so if I thought I was being overlooked. My neighbour's first floor back window is completely different to these second floor picture windows, which can peer over all bushes and trees. Paragraph 34 says, it is considered that a hip to gable extension would not be detrimental. As the words imply, that is a matter of opinion, and it is not one that is shared by any of the neighbours, many residents of West Bridgeford or myself. The use of the word glimpse in that paragraph is completely insulting to neighbours. I do recognise that this hip to gable extension does not have picture windows access for the whole width, as can be seen elsewhere in the area, but it does have windows to the floor. As neighbours have said, this will only encourage people to stand and stare out of windows and into people's gardens. Please could the committee ask that the glazing on the Juliet balcony could be coloured glass as well as frosted. Secondly, and probably even more importantly, I draw the committee's attention to the disingenuously named proposed West Elevation and the bought plan on the same proposed general arrangements plan revised document. This is not a West Elevation. It is a North Northwest Elevation. And as such, the house to the north of it is losing about a third of its southern boundary to nearly three metres high wall, which will be right against the boundary. To remind the committee members, three metres is nearly twice the height of a human. If this is not massing, what is? I feel that to impose this on the neighbours is simply cruelty. Uh, the argument is being made in the report that Rushcliffe Borough Council has allowed many people to put up similar, completely excessive extensions in West Bridgeford in recent years. This is not a good argument for allowing this situation to continue. I have a history of supporting sensible extensions as these are a good way to make sustainable use of land and to improve our housing stock. But in my opinion, Rushcliffe Borough Council are ruining the lives of many West Bridgeford residents 
by letting the situation get out of control. The planning committee can stop this. That's all, Chair. OK, thank you very much. So so uh, we've heard from uh, Mr Broxholm, the applicant, and Mr, Mr Stockdale, a neighbouring objector, and also on behalf of Councillor, uh, and Councillor Gallon, uh, statement was read out. Points seem to be uh, disagreement uh, about the patio. The applicant says he's lowering, lowering the patio, but uh, the neighbour is, is concerned about the height of the patio and, uh, and uh, loss of privacy and overlooking. That seems to be um, a particular concern. And, uh, and likewise, the ward member re referred to that as well. And, and general concerns about loss of privacy to neighbours on uh, on 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 um, Dunster Road, but also on Rodney Road behind behind the back garden. Um, so uh, I, I think that's the uh, the main main points we've covered. Do you want to pick up on any of those, please, just to help us along? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so yeah, with with regards to the proposed patio. Um, where is it? So, so you can see at the moment the red outline of the garage. Uh, on the left hand side top left corner where the mouse is uh, so the patio at present runs across the rear line to the boundary um, at, at a height of approximately one meter above the ground level um, and as you can see the patio is accessed via two steps which um, are both 20 centimeters in height so as such the patio area is to be 40 centimetres lower than the existing patio, uh, which is seen quite easily on, on this drawing in the top right corner. So you can see the line of the existing patio, which runs across, and the proposed patio is quite significantly lower. So whilst it is, so you can see the line um, here where the existing patio is, down two steps to the proposed patio. Um, so whilst it is appreciated that the patio does run three metres further to the rear, the, the, the lower level and the mitigation of overlooking through the fencing um, there's not considered to be any significant overlooking issues. Um, and then with regards to the mentioned fence and how the level of overbearing might appear for the neighbouring property on the other side, um, I, th I think it's about balance. Um, so on the, I would just like to say as well, um, if members could assess the application based on the submitted plans rather than um, superimposed images, um, because I think it's just about accuracy. And whilst I appreciate that it's trying to put a point across, we have got to assess the plans based on two scale drawings. Um, then going on to overlooking concerns, and so with regards to the rear neighbours um, on Rodney Road and their rear gardens that um, neighbours and the councillor have concerns with regarding, the, the application site from the proposed rear dormer to the rear elevation of the property on Rodney Road is approximately 52 metres. The residential design guide recommends um, 10 metres per garden, so 20 metres, whereas this is two and a half almost times that recommended amount. Um, and I think everything else has been pretty much covered um, in the report, um, unless you'd like to add anything, Emily. Could I, could I just ask about references being made to a neighbour's tree? and uh, the neighbour referred to a cherry tree. Um, for clarity, which, 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 which garden is that? And also, we did see, I did see a tree in the picture, which appears to be a big conifer, or Leylandi. Um, is, is, is that one of the same, or just? So, is in the very, very top right corner of the image. So adjacent to the brick wall, um, there's a, a tree just there, which um, I appreciate is, is relatively close to the boundary. And it's likely that routes are likely to travel onto the application site. Um, but as, as mentioned previously, um, any routes or overhanging branches, the applicant or landowner 
would have the right to remove these. Um, but it's also worth mentioning that there's a substantial amount of, of hard landscaping that's already been completed um, and, and likely damaging the roots as is. I think, Chair, it's important to note there's no proposal that that tree be removed. It's on the neighbour's property. Yeah. It is close to the boundary, close to where the patio would be. Um, um, and I think harking back to what Mr Pettit's talked to us about today, in terms of protecting trees, we look at public amenity value. And unfortunately, a fruit tree in a rear garden wouldn't have significant public amenity from those public spaces that we would look to, to um, protect it in this particular case. OK, thank you. That's that's helpful. I just wanted to be clear in my own mind which, which, the, 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 which tree we were talking about, but that's clear now. So thank you for that. Uh, right, we'll start uh, the uh, discussion. So, Councillor Thomas, you'd like to start with us, please? Um, thank you, Chair. I think as far as the tree is concerned, I think we see a lot of planning applications where there are conditions um, imposed about protection of trees in neighbouring properties. And I don't see a, such a condition in this um, application and i would request if we um move to approve this application uh, that there should be a condition um as to the building works and so on um that would um, protect that tree as far as is possible to do so that is normal um, i've seen it in other applications i would ask for that i think obviously um the owner here has gone to and there's been a lot of dialogue about it um, about this application there's been a lot of dialogue with the neighbors and with the planning officers and it's obviously been evolving over a period of time um, i just feel at the moment that still um, this is a huge extension and there are various aspects of concern which together to me add up as just too much really in in this location and those are the um overlooking and the overbearingness along both boundaries and um, the um, footprint, the huge footprint of the extension, um, the, um, the hip to gable um, change, which um, un unmatches the pair basically. And although there are probably examples elsewhere, um, does impact on the character of the area and the um, Juliet balcony in particular um, seems an overbearing feature for the back gardens adjacent and um, behind. <clears throat> so although I appreciate what the, you know the, the changes that have been made and um, uh, 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 and, and so on I, for, for me this is just just too much um, as it stands um, that's where I feel thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Bailey, please. Thank you, Chairman. Could my case officer just clarify with the Juliet balcony, the balcony screen, the glass will be opaque, is that correct? Am I correct with that? Yeah, so... And how about, so we have two windows plus two opening doors to the Juliet balcony, is that, am I correct in that? Are they obscured, or are all of them obscured glass? Uh, and can the, those windows, doors open, please? Good question. I, I was thinking, I was asking the same actually, because I know there's, there's reference in the conditions to uh, to having uh, a, a, a part, a permanently obscured to group five level of privacy. But I think we just need a bit more detail about about that along Councillor yeah. Bailey's lines. Side elevation. Well, thank you. Um, so yeah, there, there is a condition in the committee report requiring the balustrade of the Juliet balcony, uh, as you can see here, for that to be finished in uh, frosted glass, um, but not any of the windows or the, the doors. And then, as Councillor Thomas said, in the side elevation, there's proposed to be a second floor window. Uh, which you can see down here um, and that is proposed to be frosted glass as well um, so with regards to the Juliet balcony obviously um, it you won't be able to open the doors outward there'll be inward opening mm -hmm. um, and Juliet balconies in terms of planning considerations are treated the same as a as a window given that um, you can't step out onto a platform, you're level with the outside of the wall. Um, and I think um, effort has been made 
to reduce the outlook uh, of these windows given the, the frosted glass of the balcony um, and that would be secured by condition. Um, does, that, does that help? Thank you. My other query, while I'm still speaking, is that we did have emails from residents living on Rodney Road expressing concern that they would, uh, their privacy would um, be impaired. I was relieved to take, I had actually read about the Juliet balcony from screen being opaque glass, which, which I'm pleased that's the case. Um, I'm not so good on meters as, as some younger people. So I actually went on my mobile phone to work out what 52 meters means in feet. And it came out as 170.604 feet. So nearly 171 foot. That is quite a length of garden, far more than you would get in modern um, developments. As you say, normally it'd be 10 meters per garden rather than in this, so it'd be 20 in total for backing on. In this case, we've got 52 meters. Um, it certainly is a large extension, but then the way families live is very different now from when these houses were built in the 1920s or 30s, whichever the case is. Um, so, um, I think we have to get used to the idea that people are living a different way and they are working from home and needs change to meet modern requirements. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bailey. Um, any other comments, uh, Councillor Price, please? Um, yeah, my, my main concern um, is around the Juliet balcony because obviously uh, when you look at this, um, property in relation to the two on either side which do have um, uh, wi windows at that level that they're, they're much much smaller um, and I'm, I'm a bit concerned that the Juliet balcony um, even with the glazing the obscure glazing on, on the bottom half it still leaves quite a lot of window um, that isn't obscured glass um, am I reading that correctly that, that it's only obscured at the bottom half and the top half is it's clear. I think that's the case. We'll just confirm that. Yes, uh, exactly. So, um, in effect, the the window that would be clear would be just the the top half of of the Juliet balcony. Um, so, in essence. So, so, do we have detail on on kind of the volume? You know, how how big that window is that's clear? If you say that the obscured uh, bit isn't. Um, you know, how big is the, is the window that remains that is clear and that obviously provides a clear sight um, into neighbour neighbouring gardens? Yeah. So in other words, you're thinking that the the, the balustrade will be obscured, yeah, but the, the windows in yeah. the doors themselves. You're, you're just cur curious to see mm. how how big they are compared yeah, to the. Yeah. Because you know, it looks to me that it's quite a substantially bigger mm. um, window to that you can look out of than, than what's there already. So if you're going to you know, take the view that, well, actually, there's already development that's overlooking, this is nothing different. I think what I'm trying to unpick is is how different is it and how much um, greater is is the viewing area. OK, that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we haven't got the measurement on there, Council Price. Um, it is a scale plan, so we can scale it off. We can't scale it off on that laptop, I'm afraid but the applicant would be obliged to build it in accordance with the plans to the measurement of that of that balcony. To me, it looks about 60, 40, so 60 clear, um, 40 obs obscure glaze, but they would be required to build that obscure glaze screen to the height specified in the plans, if that's any help. Okay, was that helpful? Good, okay. Uh, Councillor Mason, please. Thank you. Um, I have found this quite challenging. <laughs> <laughs> this application in that there are different heights um, different levels um, all over but having looked at it uh, from different angles and, and whatever I can what I can see I found it particularly interesting the one that um, showed the back and the back patio where and thank you for that to, to the officer because that yeah that one um does make it a little clearer uh for me anyway um so having looked at it 
and uh, and listen to everybody um, and some of their concerns. Yeah, there may be one or two small concerns, and it's obviously if you live there, they're bigger than than that those concerns. But if I take it as a whole and I look at the area and I drive um, through uh, that area on Dunstan Dunster Road, um, it is an interesting area where you get all sorts of bigger, smaller, some have not been touched. Um, I can see that there is a case um, for supporting this recommendation. Um, as I say, it is a difficult one and it has been challenging, but on the whole, I wish to uh, support the recommendation, please, um, for the property. For this uh, so, so you're 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 moving the recommendation. I'm as, moving as the recommendation. The okay, Just thank you. Um, uh, do you have a seconder at this uh, this stage for for that? Or we want to, uh, oh, uh, who, whose hand went up first? Was it, was it <laughs> Councillor Bailey? I think I saw. Okay. So Councillor Bailey is seconding this. Um, right, but Councillor Thomas, you want to come back in? Okay. Could I add the amendment about protecting the tree during construction? Yes, please. yes the cherry tree. Yeah. Again, I was I got that in my mind, so uh, we'll pick up on that. Can we do something about that? The the tree protection. So, concern with tree protection is if we go back to the floor plan, the patio does come next to the tree. So even if you are protecting your tree, you still need to dig down to build the patio. So it's it's going to be ineffective. If we were significantly concerned about the tree in terms of, as I say, public amenity, um, there would have been an option for something like a no dig construction. And we could have looked at different methods. In this particular case, my view is that that tree isn't of significant enough value that we would be, be taking those steps. So I don't think you can put tree protection on because you wouldn't be able to build the, the patio in that location. And we do have to look at the plans before us. And as I say, the, the amenity value of, of it isn't such that officers have felt it necessary to negotiate a different method of construction at this point. So I'd be very cautious about that. OK, thank you. Councillor Mason, you want to come back in? Yeah. Can another a similar tree um, be put afterwards, be put in? Uh, and and likewise, the thought going through my mind is is... If, if we can't put a protection in as such, can we put any sort of advisories in with yeah. regards to uh, yeah. uh, construction, etc.? So it's linked to question, really. To yeah, so the tree's on the neighbour's land, so it would be difficult to require a replacement. As I say, it's not proposed to lose it as part of the plan. It may, it may be lost or it may be damaged. Um, we don't know that for certain. Um, so, yeah, an, an advisory note um, asking for care to be taken. Um, you know, best practice to be observed when working in that area. Maybe one, okay. one way. Okay. Do you want to come back on that? Yeah. No, no. I just, I just thought that you could actually, um, because if anything happens to that tree, you could put something in to say that they had to replace it. But that's does that only apply to if the tree is on the their land? Property? The land isn't within their control. To be able to plant a replacement, yeah, because, so that's the difficulty. Because it's, because it's neighbouring land, it's next, next door. Mm. Okay. Ponder that. Okay. Uh, Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I thought that maybe the roots could be uh, hand dug so they can be protected with sort of concrete mm. over them when, before they build the patio. I'm, I'm sure that's something I've come across before. Yeah, so there are methods of construction, um, as I say, so it's sort of no digging, do a raft or, as you say, hand digging. Members would have to be strongly concerned about that tree and about its value um, for us to, to, to put that condition on. If you feel strongly enough, we could add some words to, to the effect of a construction method, details of the yeah. construction method to be submitted, if that would. I'm, I'm seeing a few nods. Um, yeah. Here, sort of, sort of, w w w within the restrictions that we have, um, I, I, I think that's probably um, all we can do, really, with regards to, to the tree. But, but, uh, so, so it would form part of the conditions of the application. They would have to submit a construction statement and to the satisfaction of the council. 
So, uh, yeah, I can do that. Councillor Price. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the point about um, the amenity of the tree, because obviously we've discussed trees a lot um, this afternoon. Um, and it feels to me like, you know, this this tree has been mentioned um, several times by the neighbours. We've got evidence um, that it is valued and is providing amenity. So I think we should be taking steps to do everything we can to make sure that it's protected as from this development. Okay, thank you for that. Um, well, I think we've got a note, note here that uh, if, if we are minded to uh, give approval, then, then the conditions will be... Uh, uh, it, 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 right. So, so yes. So, I just need to check with my seconder on that because uh, Councillor Bailey, you seconded Councillor Mason's uh, uh, proposal or, or recommend uh, move, movement of the recommendation. You've seconded it, but there are proposals for this these extra advisory notes. So, would you be happy with those? So, Councillor Bailey would be happy with those. Right. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Thomas. Could you just confirm? Um, it was a condition a minute ago, now it's gone back to being an advisory note. Yeah, so um, I've written down an additional condition um, worded along the lines of details of the method of construction for the patio um, to be submitted prior to the patio being commenced. So, words so to that. yes. Okay, <laughs> uh, okay right. Um, I think we've had quite a good discussion on this. I don't think anyone else is want any other, raising any other points. Um, so let's make a decision. So we've got the recommendation in front of us in the report, along with the additional conditions we've just been talking about. Show of hands, please. Those in favour, please show your hands. What's that? One, two, three, four. All right. Four, four, how many is that? Is it one, two, three, four, five? Oh, I wasn't counting myself. Five. Uh, anyone against? Two, a uh, three, a uh, four. So five, five in favour, and four against. And for the record, any have we got any abstention? Well, it won't be because no. Oh, right. Okay. So that means um, permission is granted, and uh, with uh, five votes to four. And uh, as per the report, plus the additional conditions that have been put in regards to the tree. What I would say about this application, it is a like any application like this, it is um, always going to be difficult to to keep everybody as happy as possible and whilst recognizing that things do change um and uh, and that's obviously one of the reasons we're here of course is to make those decisions but i hope everyone realizes that a lot of thought has gone into this both by uh, 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 officers and uh, members of the committee so uh, thank you thank you colleagues for that so we'll um, move on to the next application and this is West Bridgeford again. And this is 46 Stanholm Drive, uh, which is for a raised roof loft conversion with dormer to the rear. And Charlotte, uh, Ms. Thompson, you're about to do this for us. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman, and good afternoon, members. Um, there is a late representation for the application that has been circulated to members. Um, the matters in the late representation are already covered within the committee report. Um, as the chairman has just mentioned, this application is for number 46 Stanhope Drive in West Bridgeford. Um, the application itself is for a loft conversion, which comprises two hip to gable extensions to the side, a rear box dormer extension, and the raising of the ridge height of the dwelling. Um, just to run members through the site plan, you can see that the property lies within a largely residential area of West Bridgeford. Um, it's located along Stanhope Drive, which largely consists of two-storey detached properties that are fairly uniform in appearance. Um, this is just an aerial photograph, again, um, showing the properties and showing that they're largely uniform in appearance. Um, just to take members through the site photos. Uh, so this is an image showing the front elevation of the application dwelling um, in its context with the neighbouring properties along Stanhope Drive. Um, you can see the existing roof form um, is a hipped shallow uh, roof. Uh, this is the uh, rear garden um, of the application site. Uh, this photograph is um, taken facing northeast um, and it backs up onto the 
properties on Waddington Drive. You can also see from the photo that the site um, is within close proximity to a number of mature trees. Um, this photograph shows the rear elevation of the application dwelling um, and the property um, to the southeast, which is number 44 Stanholm Drive. Um, you can see that on the left hand side. Um, you can also see that the neighbouring property has had a roof extension, uh, which has maintained the hit nature of the roof. Uh, this is, again, the rear elevation um, of the application dwelling um, in context with the neighbouring property uh, to the northwest, so number 48, uh, which is on the right-hand side. Uh, this is a view of Sunhome Drive um, facing northwest. Um, so you can see from here that the properties um, ha do have a uniform character, um, largely with shallow um, hip roof forms uh, throughout the street scene. Uh, this is another um, photograph um, showing the northwest uh, side of Stanhome Drive. Um, you can see again that there's another mature tree within close proximity um, to the property. Uh, this is a view of the adjacent side of Stanhome Drive uh, facing southeast. Um, so again, it uh, gives you a feel for the character of the area, uh, largely consists of two story. Uh, detached dwellings with uh, shallow hip roof forms, um, with some properties having had um, extensions. Um, this is an image of one of the neighbouring properties along Stanhome Drive, um, number 54, which has um, had previous planning permission for a loft conversion, um, but shows um, that it has not yet been implemented. Um, this is an image of a property directly adjacent to the application site, um, showing an example of a loft conversion uh, that has um, occurred along the street. Um, the loft the uh, dormer extension has respected the uh, hip nature of the roof structure. Moving on to the uh, application plans, this is just the site location plan again, showing the context of the site. Um, these existing plans, uh, again, showing the hipped nature of the roof. Um, and then these are the proposed plans um, that show, again, the two storey, um, sorry, the two side uh, hipped gable extensions, the rear box dormer. And you can see on the plans that the existing uh, roof is um, etched. There's an outline etched there. So you can see clearly the context um, with regard to the proposal. Um, in terms of the main consideration for the application um, that are set out in the officer report, uh, they are design um, by virtue of the impact of the character of the area, the impact um, on neighbouring amenity and the impact on ecology. In terms of the impact to neighbouring amenity, um, due to the separation distances between the host dwelling and the neighbouring properties um, and the orientation of the dwellings along Stanhome Drive, Officers consider that the proposed uh, roof extensions would not cause undue harm to neighbouring residents in terms of overlooking, overshadowing or overbearing impacts. In terms of ecology, um, it's noted that the proposal includes the conversion of the currently vacant loft um, and it includes the demolition and removal of the entirety of the roof. Um, the council has a duty to consider potential impacts to protected species as part of the proposed development. And due to the loft conversion, loft not having been previously converted and being within close proximity to a number of mature trees, there is potential for protected species to be present within the roof space. Officers have requested the submission of ecology survey, but this has not been provided as part of the application. Officers therefore consider that it has not been adequately demonstrated that protected species will not be harmed as part of the proposed development. In terms of the design and the impact of the character of the area, officers note that a number of comments from neighbours and the ward member have been received in support of the design for the proposed loft extensions. Stanhome Drive consists largely of two storey detached dwellings with shallow hipped roof forms, which create a strong character and a sense of uni uniformity within the street scene. The proposed roof extensions propose to increase the height of the roof and also propose to increase the marginally increase the, the pitch. Of the existing roof. Officers consider that the, um, the removal of the shallow hip roof nature of the existing roof would not allow the characteristics of the dwelling to be understood and it would unbalance the appearance of the host property. 
Officers note that there have been a number of other loft conversions along Stanholm Drive. However, other conversions that have been implemented have respected the character of the hipped roof as shown in the previous photographs. We received um, a comment from the ward member in relation to the previously approved scheme at number 40, uh, sorry, number 54 Stanholm Drive for a similar loft conversion development that was granted permission in 2021, uh, but it hasn't been implemented. Officers appreciate that the designs are similar. However, there have been significant changes in planning policy since the previous scheme was permitted. In particular, significant change to the MPPF, which put further em emphasis on developers developments needing to be well designed. The revised MPPF includes a new paragraph which states that development is, that is not well designed should be refused and significant weight should be given to existing local design policies such as the Rushcliffe Residential Design Guide. Officers consider that the change in planning policy should be applied significant weight in this instance. Members are also reminded that each application is assessed and based on its own merits and based on the current planning policies at the time of the application. Since the granting of the previous permission, we have seen examples of similar loft conversion developments come into fruition within West Bridgeford. These examples have shown that not maintaining and respecting the existing, the character of the existing roof forms, particularly along streets such as Stanholm Drive, which have strong characters, does have a detrimental impact on the character of the area, and it is not in keeping with the prevailing pattern of the street scene. Overall, officers consider that the proposed development would not be considered good design as it fails to respect the character of the existing roof form and the development would be out of keeping for the area. The application is therefore uh, before the committee with a recommendation of, a, of refusal on both ecology and design grounds. Thank you. Thank you. And we have speakers on the, on this item. So, Mr Wallach, you're, you're the applicant, aren't you? So. Thank you for your patience. We had quite a lot of applications today, so uh, uh, you know how it works. Uh, up to press the right button, you've got up to five minutes to, uh, to speak to us. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Matthew Wallach. I'm the uh, applicant at number 46 Stanley Drive. Um, myself and Laura moved to Stanley Drive four years ago, and we spent the next three years sympathetically renovating the house to bring it back to its former glory. We love the style of house. What attracted us was the potential to be extended as many houses have done on the street and in the wider area. With respect to our planning application, we came to this design because it's the most efficient use of space. It blends in with the house and there are plenty of examples of this type in the wider area. Also, our neighbour, Councillor Gray, already had his planning except for two years prior for pretty much the same design. So we subsequently spent £7,000 on our architect's drawings based on his design assuming in good faith that consistency will be applied by the planning department. To ours and our architect's frustration, it was recommended for refusal based on the lack of a BAT survey and also due to an issue with the street seat. This is quite surprising to us as we see no, see no sign of BATs at all and none of our immediate neighbours who have recently done the loft conversions have had to do one. This is in addition to a conversion a couple of hundred yards away on Greythorn Drive and also many houses in the wider area. This stroke of a pen will cost us at least £1,000 for something which other recent conversions in known areas for bats have simply not had to do. This in today's financial climate seems unreasonable to us. As, the street, as for the street scene impact, you can see from our drawings it doesn't simply look like an add-on. And my neighbour has recently raised his roof by around 600 millimetres, so that's the next door before the year four. So there is precedent. That is, in addition to the permission council the Grey has on the road. I understand my neighbour has maintained a pyramid structure, but his house has also been extended four metres at the back on both storeys, so the loft is a large and long room. For us to have small dormers, as suggested by plan, it wouldn't be worth it, as it's the only place you'd be able to stand for our smaller footprint. This, would effectively, what effectively does is ban loft conversions in the area because nobody would do it on the existing footprint. So the house over the road that has been rendered all white, that has also had a side extension on a double height, so their loft is wide and long as well so it's not the original footprint as is mentioned in councillor gray's decision report by the planning officer if he had the height he would be able to do his loft within permitted development so it seems the only thing in question here is the height this contradicts the communications i received stating that the fact that number four has similar outstanding permissions doesn't justify the design approach for ours in inverted commas where it also states that legislation has changed since 2022 to cover this fact now, I've looked at the amendments to the MPPF and I'm struggling to find any objective reason of why it would be refused. The, amend the amendments do indeed mention good design and sympathetic to local character, 
And our neighbours agree that our plans are, which are rather woolly statements anyway, and down to interpretation. But we also shouldn't forget that it also mentions in the amendments that decisions should not prevent or discourage appropriate innovation or change. Now, looking around West Bridgeford, there are thousands of examples of innovation and change, some wildly different and some not so. But this in itself brings character. What is evident is a lack of consistency. And this troubles also our architect, who has to explain to his clients what may or not be accepted. So he's understandably worried as this has consequences for his business in the, in the future. I have to point out that we live on a hill and detached from each other by about 15 feet. So no single house has prominence, as would be the case if we were all on the same level. This has been demonstrated by our immediate neighbours' loft conversions, which do not stand out prominently. However, if you look around the wider area, similar house styles, particularly on Repton or Harrow Road, which are closer together, you can see most houses have a different type of loft conversion or extension. And there are a few examples of this design as well. In addition, these roads have many individual prominent homes. Bearing this in mind, it's no surprise that many on our road look to our case for anticipation for doing their own plans. And with Bill's rise, it's not surprising that ourselves and others would also like to use the roof of solar panels for sustainability. OK, thank you. Uh, right. Well, within five minutes. So thank you for that. And uh, very clear as well. And uh, Councillor Gray. And well, I don't need to tell you what to do, do I? So. <laughs> So in my own time on the planning committee, I always tried to come to decisions taking into account the appropriate law guided by officers and ensuring they were applied with fairness and consistency. I believe the recommendation before you is first incorrect, second inconsistent with other decisions made within West Bridgeford, I think as can be seen by the representation before you this, evening, uh, this afternoon, and therefore unfair. The most obvious way that this unfairness is shown is that my own planning application for a visually similar design, just four doors away, which is in the street scene, ah, uh, so, which, uh, which is shown within the street scene, um, was approved in February 2021, but not by this committee, by a delegated decision, because it was small in scale and wasn't seen as contentious. My own application is approved and due to work is due to start shortly, I'm assured by our builders. Um, and so it'd be unfair to say the design in the application before you is not in keeping with the established and involving street scene of Stanham Drive. In the previous application for, for Dunster Road, on section 30, the officer draws your attention to houses where permission has previously been granted to support the decision. Uh, in this application, you are asked to ignore that. This shows inconsistency in how policy is applied. Allowing my application and refusing my neighbour's application um, for the same design would fail the famous Clapham omnibus test, doubly so, as it would appear there is one rule for a councillor and another for residents. This shows the unfairness. To make the point the officer's assessment is incorrect in this case, the stretch of Stanholm Drive contains a mixture of housing types, which I think can be shown. These, these images here are all from Stanholm Drive, and, and unfortunately, I think the officer's pictures cut off a number of these houses. For example, you can see the 70s infills, you can see the bungalows, you can see the yellow brick extensions um, and dormer extensions that sit on the corner of the street. So far from being uniform, this, this street has a mixture of housing styles, which I think is indicative of West Bridgeford and, uh, and, and adds to the, the character of the area. Um, across from the applicant's property, there is a property I think shown in the middle there, um, where all traces of 1950s style of house have been removed. Nobody would argue this is sympathetic, but nonetheless, it is part of the established street scene, along with the yellow brick side extensions, flat roof, steep pitches, 70s infills and bungalows. In West Bridgeford, this type of loft conversion that is being applied for uh, is, is common, uh, and variations of this house are typical. I think if we see the next image, please. Uh, so um, we see this up and down. So all of these images are taken within one kilometer of the application site and show hip to gable extensions, similar houses, some with more prominence than others. And you can see it blends very well in the street scene. Sorry, I put the, uh, the house across the road in the bottom corner there just for comparison to show how these blend with the street scene, whereas some of the other artifacts in the street scene don't blend quite so well. So returning to the issue of consistency, during the application on Dunster Road, it was also pointed out that a similar scheme could be completed on a slightly smaller scale under permitted development rights. This is uh, note 67 on the previous application. Implication being that any perceived damage to the street scene could be done without planning permission. 
Um, on my own application, there was no need for implication, and it was noted on section 20, given the fallback position that side dormers of a similar scale to those proposed could be constructed under permitted development, it is not considered justified to refuse the application on this basis. Therefore, the design is consistent with the street scene and could even be added to the street scene without planning consent. I believe the only issue here really to be considered here would be roof height, in which the officer agrees triggers the need for planning consent. The neighbour's house is uphill and an additional 30 centimetres taller than the extension that is being applied for would be at 8.2 metres. The uh, houses across the street are set further up the hill and actually set further up from the road by 1.6 metres. The applicant's next door neighbour submitted a supporting statement pointing out that raising the roof on this application would actually make the neighbouring house stand out less and improve the street scene. A modest extension of this type, should, I don't believe, should be refused on grounds of street scene. The second reason, could I have the final image, please? The second reason given for refusal is a point of inconsistency and unfairness. West Bridgeford is a suburban area. There are few confirmed sightings of bats. Uh, using the National Biodiversity Atlas, you will see there is confirmed evidence of bats in the Edwalton area, over two kilometres. So in this, uh, this shows the centre of the circle is Stanham Drive. The green areas there are uh, where bats have been found. Um, uh, there are 15 applications shown there that haven't required uh, bat surveys at a cost of between 800 and 1,000 uh, pounds, as well as the two before you this afternoon uh, that didn't have to submit bat surveys. Neither did my own new application on Lance and Drive. So I um, ask you quickly make a recommendation to approve this application for that condition. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gray. Some, no, it's okay. No, sometimes five minutes seems that forever, and sometimes it's very quick. Is it? So it's, uh, it's, it's always difficult. I do understand. Uh, so right, well, we, we we have no other speakers on this. We've heard from the applicant and uh, neighbour, well, ward member and uh, uh, neighbour. Um, it's interesting this because because of um, similar similar permissions that have been given that we've heard about, but. Uh, uh, but I know that we have the, the each application is done on its individual merits. But uh, do you want to pick up on any, any of the points that uh, the Thank you, Chairman. and um, the yes. uh, board member have said? Ooh. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to reiterate your point that each application is based on its own merits and based on the um, current planning policy at the time of the application. Obviously, that has since changed um, since the previous permission. Um, I think a lot of the points that have been raised have been covered in the officer report. Um, one thing that I do, do think is that is important to mention, though, is that um, we hadn't received an ecology survey. Um, an ecology survey needs to be done by a qualified professional. Um, we haven't received any information regarding ecology as part of the application and we do have a duty to ensure that protected species aren't harmed as part of the proposed development um, and if we don't have information as to whether there are protected species present then we can't demonstrate that there wouldn't be harm to protected species and we have a duty to consider that thank you right thank you um so so yeah this, this is it's interesting because policies have changed since the Previous permission was given for the neighbour, and I, I know that's that's a key issue. But but uh, anyway, who who would like to start to talking about this? Uh, Councillor Mason. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. So do you want to? Councillor Mason. Yeah. Mason. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, you say that the policy has changed uh, since the last one. Um, I recognise that people should look into everything and get all the information that they can. Um, is it usual um, when you're doing the and looking at uh, the application um, and speaking with the, uh, well, either with the owner and if not the owner, the, the person that has done, the, <coughs> has done it, um, to mention that a bat survey is needed. And did you say that a bat thing was needed? Just as a, as a general call of a thing. Yep, it would so be interesting that, to yes, know. Perhaps it would be helpful to have an explanation as to, as to as Councillor Mason is saying, is what, what, why, how, how does it, how does the ecology survey work, and 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 have other applications have to have the same etc. So if you give us a bit of background on that, it's especially with the change and with the change, with, of the, with the change, the, yeah, yeah. 
So, um, yeah, so um, an ecology survey isn't required as part of the validation of an application. Um, but generally speaking, um, if um, the proposal includes the removal of a roof um, in its entirety, we do request an ecology survey. Um, and that was brought up as part of the application process under this application. Um, and we did request an ecology survey as part of the application process. And we didn't receive one. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Price, please. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I'm just um, a bit concerned that we're in danger of being inconsistent. Um, um, I think you're, so I had a question um, around the BAT surveys and is that required for all similar developments and at what point um, has that change been introduced? So, so, so just so you, you just just repeat that you you want you want you want to know you have, want to have clarification as to think, uh, when does know, an ecological survey is yeah, needed yeah. or when it's not. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the answer is going to be along the lines of roof removal, but, yeah. uh, but we'll just go. Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, like like I mentioned previously, if the proposal is including the removal of the entirety of the roof, we do request an ecology survey for those types of developments across the board. Um, for something like a hip to gable that is retaining the existing roof structure, we wouldn't request an ecology survey as part of part of that. Um, I hope that answers your question, but let me know if not. If I can just add, uh, sorry to uh, add yes, that. Yes, you want to pop it? Yeah, down. we do try to be proportionate. It's not a national validation requirement. We are looking at introducing a local validation list. So we do try and take a proportionate approach to these things we appreciate it is an additional cost and on a householder extension as charlotte has mentioned for roof windows or dormers um it would perhaps seem excessive but in this particular case removal of an entire roof could have quite a significant impact if there is a species in there thank you councillor bailey thank you chairman so what we're really saying is if the two previous applications for extensions in West Bridgeford, which we've been through this afternoon, if they too were taking the roof off in its entirety, they too would have needed a bat survey. But because they weren't doing that, they were certainly extending. That is why they, did, they, weren't, need, they weren't requested to do a bat survey. And is this something that has changed recently or has this been you know, regulations for some time? Thank you. Yep, so you're correct um, with regard to um, us not requesting a BAT survey if the roof is being retained. Um, we don't have an exact date um, for when we introduce this change. Emily, if you want to add to that. No, apologies. I haven't got the exact date of when we brought that in. As I say, it's not a formal validation requirement. It's something we request. If the applicant doesn't choose to provide it, we then have to take a view as to the likely risk. Um, and the p potential harm to a protected species. So um, the, uh, the other um, ward member who's also having a similar roof um, extension in his house, um, perhaps you can't answer it, perhaps I can't, he can't necessarily reply to me, is, is are the two applications for, for the, the ward member and this one before us, are they as near identical? In other words, are both of them re requiring the roof to be taken off in both of them and if that is the case why wasn't a bat survey requested for the application for the ward member i believe february of 2021 so 11 months ago thank you yeah we, we generally have tightened up a lot of our Sorry, 2021. Yeah, generally we have tightened up a lot of our requirements um, and a lot of our looking at our planning applications to ensure that we are giving good quality decisions. So we are moving towards um, more stringent requirements, certainly in terms of design. We are trying to improve um, the decisions we're making. We're quite keen um, as a team of officers to, to implement those recommendations in the MPPF. Um, and in terms of the the BAT survey, I'm afraid I don't have the date for you today when we started requiring that. It is an informal requirement. It's not set out um, in a piece of adopted guidance or list. So it is a it is a requirement that um, 
is just dealt with informally through officers. So it, it is up to members to determine whether they think that that is excessive in this case. As officers, we we believe it's necessary and we are applying it consistently now. Um, but things change over time and we learn over time from, from what has gone before. So. Uh, you want to come back again, Councillor Price? Yeah. yeah, yeah, just to clarify, um, because obviously we've, we've got a recommendation to refuse on the basis of the ecology survey wasn't um, provided, but that's not a mandatory requirement. And um, what we're uh, and what we really need to be assessing is the level of risk that a species could be um, damaged as a result of that survey not being submitted. Um, and obviously, the information provided by the board councillor indicates gives us some additional information about what that level of risk might be um, in that particular part of West Bridgeford. So I just wanted to kind of clarify kind of the, the factors that we need to consider um, in that decision making process um, around what risk, what the risk is, because I think what I wanted to just clarify is, you know, we're not being advised to refuse on the basis that the applicant, that the report wasn't submitted, but on the risk of harm that we can see. OK, thank you. Can I, sorry, just, just come back again. So I've just checked my legislation, which I unfortunately printed off at A3 this afternoon. Um, so the legislation that we go back to, the, the advice we go back to, which is the protected species and development advice for local planning authorities was last updated September 2022. Prior to that, it was updated October 2014. So off the back of that, we have quite useful guidance in here as to how to assess when we should be requiring surveys um, so it talks about likely habitats and one of the, the likely habitats uh, would be a building suit with features suitable for bats or large gardens in suburban and rural areas. Um, so off the back of this legislation, as I say, officers believe it is necessary to assess that risk. Um, but it is not set out in any of our guidance. So it is it is a matter to give weight to how much weight you wish to give it is for you to determine. Councillor Thomas and then Councillor Phillips. Um, oh, oh. oh, sorry. Actually, I've just been told, I'm sorry, Councillor Thomas, Councillor Healy had indicated and, and my vice chairman has just nudged me to tell me so and I'm getting the look from Councillor Healy. So, so Councillor Healy and then Councillor uh, Thomas and then Council uh, and, and Councillor oh, no, Councillor Stockwood. So Councillor Healy and then Councillor Stockwood and then Councillor Thomas and then Councillor Phillips. Good grief, we all wanted to speak. Councillor Healy. Thank you, Chair. Um, just referring back to the officers' comments, really, uh, they're strongly recommending that we retain the hip style roof and to remove it really would cause harm to the character of the area. Uh, we have thrown about the ecological matters, but we can't get away from the point that no survey has been carried out and paragraph 36 of the report says the proposal is contrary to paragraph 1223 of Russia local plan 2 and it's also contrary to policy 17 paragraph 180 of the NPPF so are we in the ballpark of abusing um, for want of a better word these uh, little matter Sorry, so say again, are we in the ballpark of... I'm just wondering, you know, it's very, very clear that these there's, there's a couple of points here that are contrary to, to you know, the Rushliffe Local Plan 2 and also to, to Policy 17 of the, the NPPF. So the, the suggestion is very clear as far as I'm concerned that, uh, you know, do we want to be um, going against policy? I want a better word. I, I think you've you've probably, probably no need to answer that. I, th I think it's it's in, it's there in front of you. It's what it is. What it says. Thank you. Okay. Um, right now, Councillor Stockwood, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, this one has caused me a lot of um, oh, <laughs> consideration. I have got considerable sympathy for the points raised by the speaker, the ward member. Um, it's it's a very difficult one, I agree. But first, can I have a point of clarification? I understood 
government was encouraging us to go up a story under permitted development rights. Why does that not apply in this particular case? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's not been applied. We're assessing the application as it's been applied for. We haven't received an application for um, a prior approval for a second floor. So we're um, basing our assessment on what, you know, what has been submitted to us. Thank you. Um, yes, well, I still think we are... The proposed loft conversion in the recommendation says, by reason of its design, appearance, sighting and location would not be sympathetic to the prevailing pattern and character of development in the immediate area. Well, a lot of proof has been given to us that the prevailing character has allowed this sort of development. So, um, you know... <laughs> Quite honestly, as I say, I've struggled between refusal and acceptance. Um, and <laughs> if anybody else would like to move it, I'd be quite happy to second that we approve this one. Oh, okay. So, so you, you, uh, right. Let's think about it. So, you're suggesting you, 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 you're in effect moving a proposal to grant application, or, or, no, or you're looking for be, because, yes, say. because of the yes. being the vice chairman, it's awkward to do that. Yeah. Councillor Price, you want to come in on this? Yes, um, I mean, I think um, I, I've struggled with this one and struggled with the recommendation to refuse because I think. Um, the grounds for refusal, and that's one of the reasons that I've asked the questions that I have. Um, um, on balance, I don't think are uh, proportionate. Um, so yeah, I would be happy to move um, to grant permission. Yes, Emily, please. Um, I was just going to come in and say that if you are minded to move that recommendation, um, you might want to think about um, allowing officers to put some conditions on materials, yeah. that kind of general thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be happy with that. You need, need to keep that in, in, in your mind. Um, uh, so, right, Councillor Thomas, I know you, you're eager to speak on this. I, I know we've got a recommend a, a proposal, but we, we'll come to a second in a moment. So, Councillor Thomas. Um, I was just going to say, although things have moved on since then, really, that we were rather getting hung up on the back survey. Um, and actually, there's a, there's two reasons for recommend it for uh, refusal here. And one was the back survey, which is kind of a side thing because you know they could do that if they wanted to and then they would get the approval basically if that was the only reason for refusal but the other is the um, impact on the character of the area and so on so the first reason for refusal is um, that it, the um, by reason of design appearance sighting and location would not be sympathetic to the prevailing pattern and character of development in the immediate area and I think I, I would just like to give the um, officers another opportunity to explain why it's um, not um, in keeping with the, um, and, and not sympathetic to the prevailing pattern and character of development in, uh, in the area. We've talked about the hip roof, uh, but is there anything else um, that, that, that for this particular application for an extension makes it unsympathetic to the character of the area? Can you help us with that? The, 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 the out of sympathy, the out of character issue. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I'd just like to reiterate the points that were previously mentioned that um, you know, it does um this particular section of Stanhome Drive does have um a strong hit um shallow roof nature. And we have had developments um in other parts of West Bridgeford on similar streets like Repton Road that do have a very strong sense of uniformity. Um we've had um instances where we, they have done a similar type of loft extension haven't retained um the hip to roof structure and it has caused a detrimental impact to uh, the character of the area um one particular um instance we had was on 51 uh, 51 repton road and um, where they originally applied um for two side dorms that were set back um and they didn't um build it in accordance with the proposed plans um, and it was very similar to the proposal that we have here 
um, and we took enforcement action um, against the um, against what they had um, in you know um, built in the end because we we felt very strongly that it had um, caused a detrimental impact to the character of the area. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. I mean, I can show the picture. Yeah. Uh, we do have a picture of number 51 Repton Road um, as it was built, if you'd like, um, yeah, if that would help. So yeah, just to reiterate that this, this is quite recent, that we've looked at this particular example, and this was after these changes to the MPPF, where we really are being directed to be much stronger on design um, and bring that quality back into our decision making. And that, that really is the basis um, of where this report's coming from, is that change to the MPPF, the national guidance um, on design. So that, that's an example, as Charlotte says, on 51 Repton Road of a, uh, a similar house that's gone from a um, hip roof um, where they've um, not in accordance in this case, have gone for the, uh, the full gable there. And as I say, we have taken enforcement action and they are going to um, amend that roof style now. Yes, yes, you can come so back. Yeah. in the case that we're looking at, um, the roof height has been increased and the pitch of the roof has been changed. Is that did I get did I did I get that right? Um, they did increase um, the height of the roof. Um, yes, um, I can't. Um, I don't have the plans in front of me, uh, but I believe the pitch is the same as what was existing. If, if the height's been changed, then the pitch must have changed. I would suggest. Yeah, yeah. So it's it was they've got a, a rear dormer on the back as well. So it's similar to, to this application. Um, and yes, they did increase increase the height in this instance. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Phillips, I missed you out. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was just one question back to the bats, unfortunately. Um, is this the right time of year to be doing a bat survey? Because um, there isn't any that activity this time of year, I believe. And uh, if we were to approve the application, this could be one of the conditions that the, the BAT survey is, is done. Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, the, the timing of, of, of a survey, and if, if we were minded to grant permission, could there be some sort of condition in there? We'd just need clar explanation and clarification on that. I'm just checking my legislation again, but I believe you can do preliminary surveys at any time of the year. Um, and then if they indicate there's likely to be a roost, depending on what kind of roost, winter or summer or foraging, it depends on what time of year you do it. But my understanding is preliminary can be done, I think, any time of year. We can't condition a bat survey. Members do need to take a decision today whether they think there is a significant enough risk um, that they they are going to either make a decision to refuse on that ground or they think they are satisfied. Um, um, that there isn't the risk and that you can therefore approve it but it's it's very firmly set out that we shouldn't be conditioning bat surveys because if you condition one the bat survey comes up that there are bats you're then in a situation where you should be looking at a license from natural england um, and there's quite a stringent set of tests for a local authority to take if a license is required whether whether that is in um the correct interest so it gets very tangled very quickly um, in that case it is a difficult one, this, isn't it? It really, really is. Uh, Councillor Price. Okay, let's check. Why can't we condition a bat survey? So, sorry, say again. Okay, why can't we condition a bat survey? So, in terms of the legislation, if your bat survey comes back and says, yes, there are bats and they are going to be harmed, you then, we as a local authority, have to consider various tests as to whether a licence could then go forward. Natural England will decide on the licence, but we as a local authority are responsible for deciding um, if this is in an overriding public interest, that's something that will harm the bats, can go forward. If we've conditioned it, we can't do that test at that point because we've already made a decision on it. So we can't put it on as a condition for a survey. Um, Because you've already granted yes, permission. Yes, because you've already, so you've, because you've by the nature of it, you, you, you will have decided, yes, they got so you would, I would be very, very worried about that and think we would be liable to, to some kind of challenge on that. Um, we would be against that, that legislation and that. Because looking at it logically, if permission is granted, uh, then it's quite feasible that the work would, would start on, on the building. But then 
suddenly if a, if a, if a survey is done and bats or whatever are found in there, then you've got a difficult situation because you've got a half, perhaps a half knocked down house and, and uh, not, you know what I mean, half worked on house. Uh, 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 and, and then suddenly discover you've got wildlife protected species. That's the reason, that's the reason sort of you couldn't put a condition on. It's another way of putting it or, or am I getting confused? Yeah. It's more about you've effectively already taken yeah. the decision that the harm about you, you haven't then got a second bite of the cherry to decide if yes there's some bats and is it in it, 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 the level of harm to your bats is outweighed by the benefit of the building work if that makes sense uh, but but presumably we're kind of making those risk assessments in a similar level of ignorance all the time um because up until quite recently the bat survey wasn't a requirement. Yeah. Yes. So, so what you what what I suppose one way of putting it would be today you are uh, we are or you you we as a committee are. are determining the the risk of the likelihood of bats. If you if you have a survey that says there definitely are some bats is when you then have to apply your further tests under legislation. So if you if you come to a decision today to approve the application and then condition the survey and the survey comes back and says yes there are some bats, you can't then apply that 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 test of what the harm is to that species and whether it's outweighed by the benefit of the, of the extension effectively. There, that's a little clearer. Yeah, Thank council, you, Chairman. Uh, uh, now, oh, sorry. Yeah, Councillor Bailey and then Councillor Perdue-Horan. Thank you, Chairman. Can we clarify if the applicant knew for sure that a BAT survey was required of them for this application to be decided upon? It, so did they know it or did they not? And if they did know it, then we can assume it was their choice not to have a BAT survey. Is that correct? So, uh, yes, as part of the application, we did state that that survey would be required um, as part, you know, as part of the decision making process and they chose not to submit the BAT survey. Brief. Yes. OK, thank you for that. Councillor Purdue Horan. Thank you, Mr <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> right, Mr Chairman, I can live with a condition for a bat survey. Uh, and I would be happy to move a proposal in favour of planning permission with that condition. If it's already been moved, if, if it's already been moved, but not seconded, I'm happy to second it. I, I think the, I hear what you're saying, but the problem is, as we've heard, you, you can't actually condition a server. You, you better explain it again, um, Emily, please. I, I know exactly what you're saying. I, 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 I understand completely, but it's the, the legislation and, and what you can and can't, can't, can't do seems to be the problem. Yeah, so, so that you can't condition a, bat, a requirement for a bat survey. You can condition things like follow-up surveys once you know bats are there. Um, but the, the issue is that you, if you condition a survey that says bats are there, you then have lost your opportunity to apply the tests um, of whether, whether the harm to those bats is outweighed by the benefits of the extension, which is what's required through the, the legislation through natural and read that's required on a planning authority. So you you can't you can't have a condition for a survey on a planning application. You've got you've got to decide at this point that either actually yeah it's it's too onerous on the applicant, um, and we think the risk is very low, and therefore we're not going to require any surveys and we're going to approve it, or you say no we're worried there might be some bats and we're going to refuse it because you haven't demonstrated to us the likelihood. 
there isn't an opportunity to very strongly advise you not to put a condition on. Um, it is against the the legislation, which Charlotte has very handily just found for me. So, um, yeah, so these are the so it, it, it is set condition. out that you you know so we you should not to, be you can only grant permission if you have conditioning conditions. surveys. I really must emphasise that very strongly. There's a very strong duty on us as a local planning authority. If a, if a survey comes back, if you've granted permission, your survey comes back and there's bats, and you've then missed your opportunity to assess it, we're in quite deep water yeah. if, if we get to that point. So I, I really would strongly recommend you don't put that condition on. Well, that's the problem. So then they'd have to apply for a licence through Natural England, but we as planning authority have not fulfilled our duty in considering the impact on the bats. Mr Chairman, my main point I wanted to come to, and I thought it would be fairly simple just to get the bat issue out of the way, but clearly I've totally mis misunderstood. But I, I think it's absolutely, completely unfair to our officers for the government to simply change the MPPF goalposts every now and again at their whim. And the frustrating thing is that we then, in the main, come across these changes behind the scenes and at a particular meeting, we are forced into a very difficult position because we can clearly see the officers have been put into a very difficult position. And I, and I think this is one of these cases um, because I am I'm very concerned that um, ultimately the changes to the goalposts have meant that at the end of the day, we are making a decision based on balance of probabilities, points of view and all the rest of it and guidance and not, not clear uh, guidance. And I would suggest, Mr Chairman, that without the democratic mandate of, you know, a clear pathway for officers, that there has been a policy change at the um, plan planning policy framework group, I presume, that, you know, I think we should be very cautious in going against what we're told originally in the MPPF, that there is a presumption for development. So uh, it, from, fr from that perspective, and I'm not suggesting to you that this is actually my favourite ever design, but from that perspective, I would veer on the side of allowing uh, development because, you know, as Councillor Mrs Stock would have said, and I don't wish to repeat it, you know, we are, we are being pressured to probably go up uh, more than building out as a society. And, um, and I don't think that, that is, this is an unreasonable application on that basis. Thank you. OK, thank you. Yes, that's very, that, that, that's very clear. Um, national legislation, MPPF, well, it is what it is and it's there and it's, it's no one's fault and it's there. But obviously it's, it's, it's legis national legislation that has to be, uh, has to be followed. But I think I need to remind us as well, and, and I've got complete sympathy with what you're saying there and what Councillor Price is saying, but we also need to remind ourselves of our own local Rushcliffe policies in paragraphs 36 and 37. Mm -hmm. Um, as Councillor Healy uh, uh, alluded to, um, it, it, we, we, it, 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 well, it's there for you to read. It's, it's, it, the lack of a survey is contravening the Rushcliffe local plan. So that's that's the quandary that we, we are in, and there are several quandaries to this one. But Councillor Stockwood, you want to come back, don't you? Yes. Um, yeah, I've been on planning for twenty years now, in total, and. Um, can think of numerous instances where we've passed something and done a, a, an informative saying, if bats are found, you've got to have them relocated and, and uh, what have you. Well, you know, there could be bats in my loft for all I know. I've certainly seen them in the trees around, but uh, it didn't stop my planning permission to go in through a few years ago. Anyway, I... I, I <laughs> 
I've heard all the explanations and I stick by what I say. Um, okay. no, the policy is guidance, actually. That's very clear. That's and the Lo Rushcliffe Local Plan Part 1 says achieving well-designed places, which is what we're on about. And there's nothing wrong with this design. Um, that's in the eye of the beholder, it often is. So I, I still have no problem in um, seconding the motion to uh, grant planning permission. Well, as it, as it happens, we, 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 we had the proposal made by Councillor Price and Councillor Perdue Horan also indicated right. he was happy to second it if we get to that point. But Councillor Mason, you wanted to come in. Um, to make it more fair, I did wonder whether we could defer we could take a vote on whether to defer it until the BAT survey has been done, which then gives it a chance to come back here and, and we can still refuse it and look at it afresh. But at least we're not having one recommendation that I personally, I can say, oh, I don't know about that one. And I don't know about that one. They're two very different recommendations. So I'll just ask the officer. Well, um, we're just going to take some, have some legal legal thoughts on this. So just bear bear with okay. us on that. We're just going to come and have a word with you about um, to see if there's something that might be of interest. Uh, yes, I think that's okay. What, what time is it? Quarter past five. Yeah, turn your mics off and let's let's be back. Oh, 25 past the latest, please.
Okay, so that's, uh, that, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll start, we'll continue now. Uh, thank you for your patience, everybody, on this. This is, this is, no, it's, no, 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 don't apologise. It's a very important application, some very important points here. Um, we've, in effect, had a recommendation to grant permission and, uh, and, and has been seconded. Um, we, so we have that proposal in place. I'm going to need to take a vote on that. And uh, we, but but we have a suggestion, don't we, with regards to, and this this is a question to the mover and the seconder of the motion. Your your mind is to grant permission, but you might want to consider putting in a an advisory. And uh, solicitor, will you will you you just read well, that through us? Planning officers to word appropriate conditions as to materials. So obviously, that's not being done with the current recommendation. And, and the bats and, and the bats survey and the bats and that, yeah. advisory okay. so it's, it, so we need an informative and an advisory with regards to bats so if if we are minded to be grant, granted permission you might want to put in an advisory into into the conditions that and, uh, 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 or, or you might put sorry I'll, I'll start again not a condition you might want to add an information note or an advisory note uh, if uh, if bats are found during the the work, then work has to stop, and and the applicant or the builder has to notify the relevant authorities. That, that's that's basically that's a long way of putting it, but that's that's. So, th would you be happy to have an advisory, and that is part of your recommendation? Um, yeah, because I, th I mean I think the issue around bats, um, for me, it's always one of risk risk management you know so um the reason we ask for a survey is to establish are there bats there is it going to be um habitat disturbed and therefore what plan do we put in place to ensure that those bats are moved um if you go ahead without it you're heightening the risk because you don't know um, and if bats are discovered so if anybody proceeds with any development um without that report without that knowledge of whether that that risk is going to be realized or not um they're then they're going to be faced with the consequences which that's a protected species and then yeah and they're protected um so i think i'm totally happy with that advisory because i think what we were trying to get to with the condition um is to basically say you know th there's risk for the for the householder here and um, that if they proceed without a survey then there's going to be greater cost and disruption further down the line. So I think that that makes complete sense that we're kind of reflecting that and saying and, and achieving the objective, which is to make sure that the protected species is protected. OK, uh, Councillor Thomas. And I'm sorry to prolong the discussion, but if we're going to a vote, do we need to also include um, the opportunity for officers to add the normal conditions that would be on a planning condition um, and to um, give them scope to do that? Thank you. Uh, 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 yes, the, the, we, we, I think we've already agreed that, 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 that uh, yes, we, we have said that, that if, if permission is granted, then the standard householder uh, conditions that go into ad applications would be applied yes that's that's correct isn't it yeah right so we've had councillor price proposing just confirm who your seconder is on this was it I, i've actually forgotten myself who was second ha have you got a second for that yeah. councillor purdue horan yes so you're you're second and it's in you're happy with that proposal and, and the advisor is as well right are we all clear then we've where we are with this it's uh it's it's a it's a complicated one but uh, and and your you officers you're clear clear as well where we are with this so we've got the recommendation to grant permission subject uh, along with the advisories and and uh, and connected with the bats but also the the, uh, the materials as well along with standard householder application conditions right let's make a decision let's have a show of hands in favor of that recommendation please So how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Is anyone against it? Two. So six in favour, two against. So permission is granted. Sorry, how many? Six, three. Six, three. Right. So six, four, three against. Right. Um, permission is granted. Right. With those advisories and the conditions in place. So uh, thank you for that. Um, 
Right, that was the final application. I, mu I must say, with regards to, to the one, one we've just discussed, we, we cover all sorts of things in this committee, applications like this, and we also can also applications for hundreds and thousands of houses. I have to say that this one has been one of the most challenging and complicated. And it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? And at the end of the day, it's a house extension. Um, but we are so in the world of legislation, both national legislation, our own policies, and also the responsibilities we have as an authority to reflect those policies, but also to reflect the needs and the market and, and the needs of the householders. Um, so that's what we're here to do. It's, it's, it's a balancing act. And I know some people will be happy and some people won't be, but that's planning, isn't it? But uh, we've made the decision and, you, and officers, I, I appreciate your help. I, I know you all put a lot of time and effort into this, this, well, as you do in all of them, but this application in particular has been very challenging. So with that said, there's no other items on the agenda, so we'll bring the meeting to a close at 5.28. Thank you for your contributions and thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you. Thank you.